So if you don't know me, this is your first remote airflow class. I'm Tom Jalene, I'm the president here. And today we have Chris, I'd say Dietzik, but you'd say Zizik. <laughs> um, Chris is the general manager of the, acoustic, the noise control group at Price Industries. And he's been there, I found out yesterday, for 16 years, so right at the very start. And I'll share this. Um, I've been doing this a little bit longer. Um, and I've represented a bunch of lines that maybe you've heard of, like Semco and Aerosonics and whatever. And honest to God, I didn't know, even though I represented those lines, I didn't know a thing about acoustics until I started working with Price, which is a little, <laughs> that's not really a source of great pride for me. I just, you know, hey, we need a box, just stick in this duct system to do some stuff. And they'd say, yeah, here you go. So everything I've learned about acoustics has come from Price since they started their line from a very humble beginning of nothing. They started from scratch. Sure. So we're gonna learn a little bit about how you go from scratch to being an industry leader in a short what, 16 years. Um, so Chris is gonna do, uh, Chris was here on Tuesday, did a great job. This class is a little more basics focused. Um, so glad you're all here and thanks Anna. Jacob, Caleb. Um, so Chris, without further ado, anything I missed? I think I got no, it. I think that's a Those great the fine points. precursor. So yeah, it'll be a fun day of acoustics here. All right, sounds good. All right, take it away, Chris. Okay, thanks, Tom. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And uh, as Tom mentioned, I'm pleased to be here to present one of our training sessions on acoustics. And today's gonna be a lot more fundamentals kind of the basics of acoustics and noise control, some theory, some practical application. And I think it's gonna be a really useful kind of guideline to how this all works and how you can apply it to HVAC type applications. I wanted to start off with just introducing myself. Tom did a great job already, but as he mentioned, I'm the GM for Price Industries at Noise Control Department. My last name is horrible to spell and uh, I'll take any pronunciation I can get, but I pronounce it Desic. it's kind of a simple way but uh, don't feel badly if you say it wrong. And I oversee our noise control group at Price Industries. So we've got a great team of application and design engineers. Um, we have multiple facilities and factories across North America, and we provide a lot of solutions to noisy commercial building equipment and mechanical devices. Today's presentation is really gonna go through understanding duct acoustics. And we're gonna start with the fundamentals of acoustics, what is sound power, sound pressure, NC, RC, EBA, that sort of thing. We're also gonna delve a bit deeper into noise control products, looking at what they are, how they work, how they're tested, some of the qualifying metrics we use to compare them. We're gonna to touch on a topic of acoustic analysis. And acoustic analysis is a very powerful tool and software that you can use for analyzing sound and predicting how loud a space would be before it goes into construction. And then finally, we'll wrap up looking at some real world practical case studies and examples of how all of this information kind of ties together into real world installations and solutions. So let's begin with the fundamentals and really some stuff you may already be familiar with, or this might be new material to others. And I think it's a good foundation for everybody, whether you're a specialist in acoustics or even just a generalist in HVAC or mechanical design or engineering, Sound is a big part of the world in which we live. When we talk of noise, the simplest definition is really any unwanted or excessive sound. Not all sounds are noise. If you're listening to music, if you're at a performance, you wanna be able to appreciate and hear that. But when there's loud, unwanted, unnecessary, excessive noise from generators or even something like a hand dryer in a bathroom, a large fan, or maybe that opposing sports team. Ooh, those Bruins fans <laughs> all the Leafs. They won last night, apparently. <laughs> maybe one Leaf fan. Uh, I'm a big hockey guy, so I got some hockey examples. But the Bulls, the Cubs, you guys, Chicago fans. No, I figured Milwaukee may not like Chicago teams, but anyways, these are all kind of noise sources. We want to eliminate, mitigate, attenuate noise, and uh, there's many different ways you can do that. Sound is also often forgotten about or misunderstood because you can't see it. You can't perceive exactly how it's transmitting. 
And a big part of that is that sound is basically a pressure fluctuation in the air and the atmospheric pressure that we operate in, that we're located in. It's moving in a wave through this medium of air that you can't actually see like you would water or some other material. And these infinitesimally small changes and pressure, pressure fluctuations are how humans perceive that noise and are bothered by it, whether it's low frequency, high frequency, these sound pressure fluctuations in the air are what's actually happening to our ears and our eardrums when we perceive that. Something that's often misrepresented or confused is the difference on how we describe sound. And what I mean by that is there's different terminologies to describe sound power, sound pressure, and what they are and how they work. Sound power in the simplest form is often denoted with LW. And a good way to understand what sound power is referring to is that it's the amount of acoustical energy or power independent of environment. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't matter where that device or that mechanical system is located, it's going to have that same amount of sound power associated with it. Sound pressure, on the other hand, often denoted LP, is very dependent on the environment. And sound pressure is typically what we're hearing, what we're listening to, what we're bothered by. And it depends on where you're located, how far you are away, the space you're in, indoor, outdoor, and the difference between these is important to kind of understand the difference between sound power and sound pressure because they're not equal and the same. A great analogy a professor actually showed me many years ago in, back in college was something like this here. Everyone's been around a fire or at a campsite where you have a fire burning and the sound power and pressure can be analogous to the heat from a fire. The bigger the fire, the more power that fire is gonna have, the more energy, the more logs burning, the size of that fire could grow or shrink depending on the size and amount of wood that would be in said fire. As you move closer or further away from that fire, your intensity changes. The heat that you would feel is getting hotter or colder as you move closer or further away. The pressure, could be seen as the heat from that fire. As you step back five, 10 feet, you often can't feel any of that fire. As you move closer, it gets very hot. This is very similar to sound, power and sound pressure, where you have a very loud fan, for example, it's a big, powerful, noisy fan. The sound pressure of that fan would dissipate over distance. As you get further away, that sound energy is gonna lessen the sound pressure in that case. Does that make sense? Kind of a neat analogy to refer to sound power, sound pressure. This slide I find quite fascinating, and you don't often see this comparison, but humans have a very wide range of hearing. When you're born, when you're an infant, on the best case scenario, you roughly can hear from 20 to 20,000 hertz, a very wide range. Most of us in this room and on the call have been to, you know, sporting events and rock concerts and damaged our hearing through our lives and our hearing range will dissipate over time. Most people in this room probably can't hear much over, you know, 12,000, maybe 15,000 hertz. But in general, humans have a very wide range of hearing. Some animals have extremely wide ranges of hearing, either on the low or the high end frequency range. Elephants, for example, can hear very low frequencies because of the size of their ear and the size of a long, low frequency wavelength. Things like mice or bats can hear extremely high frequencies, almost ultrasonic. Politicians, well, they don't really hear anything we say, so it doesn't really matter for this purpose. Very sly. That's my <laughs> very in there. Sly. <laughs> when we talk of sound, we often refer to things like hertz and frequencies and wavelengths. And this slide has a lot of information, but it's great information that I hope you take away a great understanding of how sound waves and frequencies are related. Wavelength is a simple formula. Does anybody happen to know what 1130 is? The engineers, what's 1130? That's the speed of sound. So the speed of sound, the wavelength is essentially equal to the speed of sound over the frequency. And 
when we talk of frequencies, we usually look at eight octave bands. 63 hertz to 8,000 hertz is common. In this case, we're actually showing 31 and a half hertz. But in general, most mechanical equipment, terminal boxes, fans, chillers, generators will have sound power in eight octave bands available from the manufacturer. Low frequency sound has a very long wavelength, 18 foot wavelength at 63 hertz. And if you can imagine 18 feet, that's from me to calm away, this big, long, swooping wavelength. As the frequency gets higher, the wavelength gets shorter. And you can see at 8,000 hertz, the wavelength is only 1.7 inches, a very short wavelength. And you can kind of see that depicted in this graphical representation at the bottom, where the frequency of sound is highly dependent on the wavelength. The lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength. The higher the frequency, the higher, the shorter the wavelength. And you can audibly hear that as well. Low frequency is like a rumble, a bass sound. High frequency is like a hiss, and it's all dependent on that wavelength. With this being said, where do you think on the spectrum of frequencies would be harder to attenuate, harder to block or absorb? Low frequency or high frequency? What do you think would be harder to attenuate? Any guesses? Anyone? Low. Low. Yeah. But I kind of I wonder about that a lot because okay, so the first sixty-three hertz octave band is eighteen feet. How do you get any attenuation? Because that wavelength can move right through a silencer, but there must it must not just be one wavelength. There must be like an infinite number of wavelengths. So some of the waves can go right through the silencer and some of them get caught. Great answer to Is the that, question. Yeah, and-, and Did I just low, steal another one of your slides like I did? No, you're, you're expanding on this and I think you understand it well that low frequencies, like an 18 foot long wavelength is hard to block or absorb. And something like a wall is a good example. If you had a mechanical room with a large generator in it, some of that low frequency sound is gonna break or transmit right through a traditional building wall easily. Well, this, like this table is like close to 18 feet. So the wave is just this long swooping wavelength. Yeah. And that's where you move to things like high transmission loss materials, like a concrete brick, like an eight inch thick concrete wall is going to absorb and block a lot more of that sound energy than something like a one inch thick fiberglass lining. Whereas on the high frequency range, you know, a two inch wavelength could be absorbed in something like a fiberglass duct liner or an acoustic um, treatment on a wall, like a, a fabric or a textile. To expand a little further, and I think you have a good understanding of this, low frequency, long wavelength sounds like a rumble. High frequency, short wavelength sounds like a hiss. And that's sort of important to understand when you're looking at components and devices and mechanical systems, different types of systems and components have different frequency ranges. Fans and pumps are typically on that low range frequency. Diffusers and dampers are typically on that higher range frequency. Higher velocity air, more like a hiss sound, lower you know, vibrational noise or bass sounding frequency ranges are on that lower scale. And you can often use this knowledge to help diagnose maybe where a problem is coming from. If you walk into a room and you're like, wow, it's loud in here. It's coming from this diffuser, it's high frequency, or there must be a fan or a pump or something running because it's very low frequency. It's great to have a basic understanding of that for that purpose. We also use the decibel scale a lot when looking at acoustics and talking about sound and everyone's heard about, you know, decibels, 10 decibels, 50 decibels, hundred decibels. The scale is used to refer to sound levels and background sound levels and mechanical devices on a logarithmic scale of how we perceive sound. In general, on the low range under 50 decibels, these are quite pleasant spaces to be around devices that are operating in our normal lives and environments. As you get in that 50 to 80 decibel range, 
these are kind of where you're starting to get into that level of annoyance or louder exposure to sounds. In excess of about 75 to 80 dB, these can be areas where you need to be concerned with potential hearing loss, where you need to protect your hearing if you're exposed to loud sound sources for extended periods of time. And typically humans have quite sensitive hearing where if you're in a loud environment, say 85 dB or above, hearing protection should definitely be worn, especially if you're exposed to those sound levels for long periods of time. Eight hours at 85 decibels could cause permanent hearing loss over many days of exposure. We also use the decibel scale to refer to sound sources, things like this, where you have a fan at 90 dB. This is quite common. But what if you had two fans running both at 90 dB? In general, when you have multiple sources or multiple sounds operating simultaneously, you would take those 90 plus 90 and it would yield 180. 180. <laughs> Correct. Tom gets a, a prize. No, that's not right, thankfully, because at 180 decibels, we'd all have permanent hearing loss. When you take two sound sources and add them together, 90 plus 90 actually yields 93 dB. And you may look at that if you're not familiar with sound and say, well, that doesn't seem right. Everything I know about mathematics is out the window. Well, sound and sound sources are added logarithmically. So 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 90 would actually yield 96 dB. Slowly, it comes. Why is that? Well, again, when you add sounds on the logarithmic scale, 90 plus 90 is 93, and then 93 plus 93 would yield 96. And using that logarithmic scale, there's some mathematics behind it and logarithmic equations. I won't make you do logarithmic mathematics at 9 a.m. I'll probably lose a few people on the call, but this is basically the formula that's being followed, where it's 10 times the base 10 log of the total number of sound sources at the sound level in which they're operating. Looking something like this, base 10 log of 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 90 would then yield that 96. And this is often why sound gets a little bit fuzzy and confusing to people, is that it's not numerically added together as you normally would. It's logarithmic. The good thing about this logarithmic addition is that when you have two sound sources operating simultaneously in series or parallel or however they're installed, when the difference between those two sources varies, the summation of the two of them is going to sort of taper off. And that's a little bit of a confusing topic, but this graph does a great job of explaining it. Essentially, when you have a zero difference between two sound sources, so like I showed 90 plus 90, they're the same, you would actually add 3 dB to those two sources. Let's hypothetically say you had a bigger difference, a 4 dB difference. So not 90 plus 90 anymore, but actually, Eighty plus seventy-six. So instead of the same sound source, there's a four dB difference. And based on this logarithmic scale, it's actually a one and a half addition to the higher of the two. So eighty plus seventy-six would actually just add one point five to the eighty, yielding eighty-one point five. As you go further in that difference range, all the way up to say ten dB. So if we had 80 plus 70 dB, we're now at that low end of the addition. We're actually under 1.4 of a decibel. So if you had a fan running at 80 dB and another fan at 70 dB, you would only really audibly hear the 80 dB fan per se based on that addition where the 70 decibel level is so much less that it's almost negligible. And it gets even more so as you go further on that spectrum. So if you had, you know, a refrigerator running at 40 dB and a fan running next to it at 80, the refrigerator is negligible. You wouldn't hear anything from that. Have you ever had it where, so you've got an air handler with a supply fan and a return fan and the 
manufacturer just use the raw sound data? Like, have you ever run into that? I mean, that's the only example I can think of other than fans on a roof. Yeah, it, it happens often, to be honest. Like, people will be looking at mechanical equipment, whether it's an air handler or a fan or a chiller, and use the wrong sound data. They'll use the A-weighted sound pressure that was measured 12 feet away instead of the raw sound power of that equipment. Um, it happens commonly in the industry. And it's a lot because, you know, I myself am a mechanical engineer. I didn't have a lot of acoustic training in theory in college and university. It's just not something that's covered in great detail and you forget about it over time. But some of the stuff you're learning today, I think is very important to be aware of. I'm gonna take a quick second and mention, I've got some great prizes and swag stuff here. Uh, Contigo cups and a shirt and some books and things. I want you guys to be interactive, both on the call, on the, uh, the webinar and in the room. So if you have a question, if you wanna make a comment, throw your hand up and I'm gonna enter you in a little draw for one of these prizes. So the more questions you ask, the more chances you have. Tom, I don't know if you- Yeah, and if you're, you're visiting remotely, um, we'll send it to you. Yeah, we'll get it to you virtually as well. We'll, we'll, we'll get you the physical thing yeah. to the virtual attendees. Yeah. So taking all that fundamentals we just reviewed, I want to take it a step further and actually look at how we apply this in commercial building acoustics. Well, in general, we use a great reference table from ASHRAE Applications Handbook, that brownish burgundy colored book that a lot of you have on your desks. And there's a great table in all the different versions of ASHRAE's Applications Handbook that essentially references the type of rooms and their primary usage and what the background sound guidelines are for those spaces in NC, RC, and DBA to be shown as what's appropriate for a different type of space. I apologize, this is kind of tough to see maybe in, this, in the room or on the call, but something like an office building conference room Ashray would recommend NC30 for that space. Well, what does that mean? What is NC30? Well, these are great single number references of the background sound within a space. So what does that mean? What is single number reference of a background sound? So if you look at the top of this slide, there's a table of LP, sound pressure, as we learned earlier, in each octave end. And if you came in this room with a handheld sound microphone or your iPhone or Android device and took a recording and looked at it, this is what you would sort of get. 49 dB at 63, 42 at 125, and so on. If you use those values and say you called me and said, hey, Chris, you know, my office is at 49 dB at 63 hertz, 42 at 125, 40 at 250, I'd probably say, okay. I don't know, is that loud, is it not? It's hard to kind of transmit that information. And that's where these NCRC DBA come in very useful. By taking these sound pressure levels and plotting them on a series of different charts or applying weightings or deductions, it would yield these values. So let's look at this in a little more detail and NC specifically. NC is one of the most common used in HVAC and commercial buildings. And it stands for noise criteria. Noise criteria NC was developed actually in the mid fifties. It's not new by any means. It's been around for a long time. And essentially what it is, is a set of standardized parabolic curves that you plot your sound pressures against. And the highest curve that's crossed is your noise criteria. It's a very simple, useful tool for depicting the background sound within a space. It's often also used for things like terminals or diffusers or grills to give you an NC value on what that product would provide in a standard type of space. One thing I'll mention is that it's a little bit limiting. It doesn't give you much data other than that single number reference, in this case, NC40. You don't know that that NC40 is being set at 2000 Hertz typically. You would just have NC40 as your depiction of that space. So it can be a little bit limiting, especially if you had something like a big 
pitch frequency or a spike on this graph that could be quite problematic. All you would have in that case is that NC50. You wouldn't know it was maybe one octaband causing it. I have to say this chart, when I first started using it, was really confusing because I'm like, I've got sound power from a fan. Yeah. I've got sound power from an air handler. And then I see this NC chart and I did not understand how to get from A to B. You're not the only one. I think no, it, I, it is I, confusing. And I hope this clarifies it a little bit. For it does. Well, I, I really didn't have anybody present the NC graph before. It's like, oh, okay, well, here's your, you did it or you didn't do it. You know, the the silencer manufacturer said, oh, yeah, yeah you're good. Yeah. Or, or you're just comparing yeah. one silencer against another, but not going from, hey, where are we starting from our sound source to this result? I don't know, Anna, do you use NC graphs very often? Not the graph, just the number. You just use the number, right? Um, the question is, uh, what's the difference between NC and RC, which I think we're going to cover. We are, yeah. Um, John was asking, what is the difference between NC and RC? So great question. Let's jump to the next slide here and we'll find out. So I mentioned NC developed in the 1950s, probably the most commonly used. A lot of engineers will use it daily and maybe not even truly know like what it means or where it comes from. This is where it's coming from. RC, I'm sure if my clicker is dying or if it's just uh, slow this morning, still waking up. RC is a little bit newer, developed in the early 1980s and stands for room criteria. And it's very similar to NC. It's a single number reference. It can also be used as a great diagnostics tool, where if you have a space and you want to understand what's happening in that space, you can take a sound pressure measurement and plot it on the series of more linear curves and understand what that RC value would be. One of the benefits of RC over NC is that it actually takes an average of several octobands and it gives you these colored uh, linear curves will tell you if that sound spectrum is either a neutral sounding sound, a hiss, a rumble, it'll give you better indication of how that frequency range is perceived. Again, it's not used as much as NC, it's a little bit more complicated maybe, for some people to understand or use, but it's it's a great tool, and you can also compare NC and RC kind of simultaneously. Something we see a lot is design criteria and bylaws must meet NC forty or must be at fifty five dBA at nighttime. This is something we see in specs, we see in legislation quite frequently in. Uh, in reference to background sound levels, where the nighttime chiller must be at 55 dBA at the property line. Well, what is that? dBA is another type of sound criteria that essentially applies a correction or a weighting to more better represent the human's frequency response to sound. And what I mean by that is that you can see the DBA correction is a standardized deduction that you actually remove certain amounts of sound power in certain frequencies to better represent how humans are annoyed or perceiving sound. Humans are generally more sensitive to higher frequencies of sound. A very high frequency noise will drive you kind of crazy. It's, it's very annoying. Low frequency, you know, we can kind of deal with it. It's annoying, but it's doesn't really upset you in the same way usually. It's still problematic, but maybe in a different type of way. And that's why these weightings are applied. When you take this DBA correction and you can numerically again, add these together to get your result in DBA, that's what's happening there. You weight it with a series of corrections and then you would have that single number reference in this case, 93 DBA. So I hope that gives you a good understanding, you know, NC, RC, DBA. We're gonna look at that a little bit more in a later session this morning, but that's a good precursor to what they are and why they're used. Another terminology and criteria that is quite common is STC, sound transmission class. This is a little bit different than NC and RC. STC 
is effectively, again, a single number rating of how effective a material is at blocking sound. So if you had something like a wall or a partition or a fabric, different materials will have different STC values. And you'll see this a lot in construction materials. Gypsum board or a wood door or a window will have a different STC value. Last night in my hotel, there's a lot of construction going on in Milwaukee. I don't know if this is a thing that happens this time of year or what, but there were, they started road work at like 11 o'clock at night last night. And it's quite noisy. And I thought to myself, you know, what is that noise? And I opened the window and I looked and you can see all this equipment and that sound energy easily transmits through something like a window when it's low frequency, high sound power. That's where that STC comes in. And you can actually buy, you know, STC rated windows and doors. Doors are quite common where you want to block that noise. But I thought to myself, if only this hotel had STC rated windows, I wouldn't hear that as much. I turned on the uh, air conditioner in the room and it muffled that noise a little bit. So it made it quite pleasant, but I needed some background noise to kill the otherwise noisy construction. A good example of this STC is something like this here, where you have a single drywall stud construction would yield something like an STC 40 transmission loss. If you add a double wall to the inside, this would increase that overall effectiveness at that blocking of sound. Adding an additional layer on the outside would yield even higher STC values. So again, STC is a good way to reference the transmission loss of sound. Sound being able to transmit through a barrier or a wall or a surface. Another criteria for referencing the amount of acoustical absorption is actually NRC. So STC is sound blocking. NRC is actually sound absorption. And NRC is used when you're looking at a typically sound absorbing material like a carpet or a ceiling tile or a textile that might absorb sound. The way that NRC is used and calculated is basically a coefficient. And there's a lot of words and information on this slide here, but the basics of NRC is that if you take the sound absorption coefficient of 250, 500, 1000, and 2000 Hertz, and you average those four frequency absorption coefficients, you're gonna end up with this NRC value. NRC typically ranges from zero to one. Zero being perfectly reflective and one being perfectly absorptive. So for example, a glass window or wall would have a very low NRC value. Most of that sound is gonna reflect off of it. A ceiling tile, like a commercial fiberglass or mineral wool pressed ceiling tile often have a higher NRC value, something like a 0.8, a 0.9. 0.8 could be seen as 80% absorptive or 0.9 would be 90% absorptive where 90% of that incident sound wave that's propagating towards it is gonna be actually absorbed in that material. So NRC, sound absorption. I wanted to kind of bridge the gap between acoustics and noise control here to explain how noise control products really work in practical insulation. This table shows a comparison between a traditional sheet metal duct so say a 10 foot long, 24 by 24 inch ductwork and the attenuation properties that this duct would have. In general, unlined sheet metal duct has very low sound absorption potential. There's nothing in that duct really to absorb noise. You get a little bit of low frequency reduction, mainly from sound actually breaking out of that casing into the area it's located. As you add a one inch or a two inch liner, a fiberglass duct liner, you can see you get quite a bit of that mid to high frequency attenuation. Like we learned earlier, high frequency, short wavelength, that's why that's being absorbed in such a high manner there, where the low frequency, you're not getting much of anything, very similar to basically an empty duct. This is interior lining, I assume. This would be an interior like uh, fiberglass duct liner. For comparison, a silencer, 
which we're going to learn more about today, gives you relatively broad attenuation in really all frequencies, especially in this low frequency, you're getting a sizable amount more in just a three foot long silencer compared to 10 feet of line duct. And that's where silencers have a great purpose. When you have a ducted HVAC system and you need to attenuate some of that noise, a three foot or a five foot silencer is gonna give you a sizable amount of attenuation, more than you know two inch fiberglass duct lining at 10 feet long. So you can imagine a 10 foot long silencer would yield even more. Silencer, hey Chris, just yeah, a question for sure. Wrap doesn't do that much. Wrapping the exterior doesn't do that much for you, does it? So wrapping the exterior of a duct would do very little for sound absorption because your sound energy is outside or sorry inside of that duct. Wrapping it has a lot of thermal benefits. It'll have transmission loss. It won't break out as much, but it doesn't really absorb much inside the duct at all. So when you're using your calculator, you just call. Wrap duct is the same as it's pretty much almost the same as unlined duct. Um, usually, it's more for either thermal benefit or protecting it. I go through the trouble when I use the calculator to make sure I wrap it, and then I'm like, uh, maybe there's no point. To this. Yeah, it doesn't help a lot with that insertion loss we're talking about here. Right. Silencers are tested to a very specific standard, usually under lab conditions, and we're going to talk and show. A lot more of this in the next section as well, but I wanted to just introduce it at this point. We use a standard called ASTM E477, and that's the standard used for testing noise control products, prefabricated silencers as shown kind of in the middle of this image here. This is actually a, a rendering of our lab where we test and develop noise control products, and we're going to look at it in more detail, but effectively, Noise control products are tested for that insertion loss on how much sound they can absorb or attenuate. The test is typically done in a matter like this, where you start with a sound source chamber. You have a series of different pieces of ductwork. And then finally, you're left in a reverberant sound chamber or room. And this setup is used essentially to mimic a traditional you know, noise problem where you're generating sound energy, you're transmitting it through this duct, and then you're measuring it in this reverberant room. Similar to how you'd have you know, a commercial building where you've got an air handler unit, your supply ductwork, and then the occupied space. It's somewhat similar to that. The way the test is typically run is that you actually generate sound blow it through the ductwork and record it in that room. You then insert a silencer and then rerun that test under ideal conditions and airflows. By inserting that silencer is what that insertion loss refers to. The more insertion loss, the more sound the silencer has removed. And that's what traditional sound attenuators or silencers are designed for removing sound from a duct system. And they work very well like that as shown in that tabular representation. There's a lot of different types of silencers and silencers are pretty cool. And I don't just say that as the GM of a manufacturer that makes them, but there's a lot of customizability around noise control products. This is a traditional circular silencer and you can see there's a center pod and sort of an outer perimeter ring that has acoustic media contained within it. And these are traditional noise attenuating devices that are either coupled with a fan or in a duct where all of that sound energy that would otherwise be transmitted is absorbed and attenuated in the acoustic media contained within them. And there's a lot of different types of silencers that we're gonna look at in a lot of detail about an hour from now. Another noise control product that works extremely well for mitigating sound is acoustic panels. And acoustic panels, as I explained earlier, have two different criteria that work very well. STC, the transmission loss of blocking noise, and NRC, the coefficient of absorbing noise, where sound propagating towards these panels will either be absorbed in that media or blocked by the casing. And they work very well for that intention. Another type of 
noise control solution is an acoustic louver. And there's a lot of different types of designs and colors and blade styles, but effectively an acoustic louver will allow air to either enter or exit a mechanical space and the sound that's present will be absorbed in these acoustic baffles. A really kind of unique product that allows ventilation, but also attenuation. And you get that transmission loss like you would a panel on the previous slide, but also you can allow air to freely flow in or out of that mechanical space. So a great sort of attractive way to ventilate a mechanical space, but absorb that noise that would otherwise be radiated into the environment. Chris, the underside is perf, is it? On, Pardon? On an acoustic louver, like the back side of the blade is perf, is it? Correct. Yeah, it is. So it is. Okay. The the back side of these blades are all perforated metal. Okay. Um, kind of hard to see on the rendering here, but similar to how you have perforated metal on acoustic panel, the inside of an acoustic louver is always perforated. Whereas a traditional louver wouldn't have perforated metal. It would just be all solid and air and water, whatever could be blocked by those blades. Another topic I just wanted to introduce is the concept of quiet terminal units. And this is something at Price, we've spent a lot of time and energy developing and testing and sort of understanding the science behind. But in general, when we refer to the terminology of a silencer, this is a traditional sound attenuating device with baffles and acoustic media sort of on the sides of this casing and perforated metal on the inside liner. And silencers are primarily what we use for attenuating HVAC duct noise. An attenuator is actually a device that just has a fiberglass or a foil faced or some sort of interior lining. It doesn't have a baffle, it's just a one inch or a half inch liner on the duct itself. And there's sort of a big difference between the two. A silencer, again, is gonna attenuate broadband frequencies, higher and lower frequencies. Attenuator, basically more of the higher frequency sound. With a terminal unit, a VAV box, there's a lot of different options to attenuate noise from that discharge sort of outlet. One is applying a silencer and another is applying an attenuator. Something that we've seen and that we've spent a lot of time researching is that terminal units are tested to a very specific standard called ASHRAE 130 for discharge noise and pressure drop. Silencers are tested to a different standard, the ASTM E477 standard we talked about earlier. When these products are coupled together and close coupled, the performance can often be unpredictable. And what I mean by that is that often these devices are from, you know, manufacturer A and manufacturer B, different standards, different manufacturers. And when they're close coupled, they can have unpredictable performance. What we've seen and through testing we've kind of developed is that the ideal silencer insertion loss, this E477 is at the top here, this gray curve. And this is insertion loss over octave band. So the higher the insertion loss, the more sound you're taking out. What we found is that as you move that silencer closer and closer to the terminal unit, the performance of that silencer actually degrades. The inlet condition of the silencer and the system effect of having them close couple will limit the amount of attenuation that silencer can offer. And the colors are a little bit hard to maybe reference, but at 60 inches long, five feet apart, you get closer to the ideal insertion loss under the silencer test standard. As you move that down all the way to zero inches or close coupled, the insertion loss is almost half. In some cases, actually, a negative or a sound generator by close coupling those together. The reason for this and what we've really found is that when you apply noise control devices like silencers to terminal units, they need to be tested as an assembly to the AHRI and ASHRAE 130 standard so that they're intended to go together, not sort of mismatched products from mismatched test standards. 
And when they're close coupled together and tested as an assembly, you can get optimal performance by having the design intent and geometry of the product matched closely. And this is where quiet terminal units come into play. Yeah, I'm really glad you added this because when we do regular acoustic analysis, we look at the source mm -hmm. and you go, oh, I'm running through a VAV box, what should I do? You almost have to, I mean, you tell me, but it would make sense that you would almost have to do two paths. Correct, or add it into your path as a separate element that would have, you know, a sound generator okay. component to it. And I'll show that in the analysis section, actually, how it can be done. But something that we've done specifically at Price is we've developed a terminal unit that has that silencer built into the assembly. It's not a separate add-on. It actually is part of the terminal unit. And we've done that by improving the inlet condition of the silencer. There's a little bit of a, a void here, a space. We've actually optimized this free area so that the damper positioning and the inlet of the terminal unit are sized appropriately for that silencer. And we've also designed the silencer to limit the pressure drop of the assembly. And it's something that when you're working with terminal boxes and they're in areas of sound sensitive spaces, it can be a great consideration to use something like this, a quiet terminal unit where it's got a noise control device built right into the design. We also do this a lot at price in general for many different types of products because we're not just a manufacturer of noise control products. We also build things like terminals and diffusers and fan powered boxes and things like that. It's nice to be able to develop a product that works well together as an assembly. So that sort of concludes our first hour here on, uh, on noise control 101 or acoustics 101. We're gonna take maybe a short break here. If you guys wanna grab a, a coffee or a bite to eat, um, maybe we'll start back up at about 10. Sounds good. That's uh, uh, just before 10 o'clock. Yeah, why don't we just start right at 10? Okay. Okay. Perfect. Good stuff. All right. Thanks. Uh, okay. And we're back. And we're back. All right. So I'm going to take all of the stuff we did in our first session here and kind of apply it forward into a bit of a a deeper dive into the actual test standard and laboratory that we use for measuring and cataloging our sound performance. We're gonna call this section acoustic performance data and laboratory. And it's kind of a neat look into one of our facilities at Price, we call it Price Research Center North. And we've got a large area for acoustical mockups and testing of noise control devices. We've got about 30,000 square feet of testing and development space in our Winnipeg uh, laboratory. And this is kind of a neat shot of the main area that we test noise control products. There is a lot of misconception and confusion around sound, and I hope to be able to clarify it and show you why we've gone to the extent that we have to be able to create a very accurate and current testing chamber. The lab is set up, as I showed earlier on that slide, in a matter kind of like this here. And I'm actually gonna take you guys kind of to the lab through a series of videos here and show you some of the different areas and ways that we have it set up. And really the heart of the lab is this reverberant sound chamber. We were talking at the break about different types of testing and acoustics and there's different types of acoustic rooms that are used for measuring and recording sound. A reverberant chamber is extremely reverberant as it's described. All hard surfaces, eight inch thick concrete construction in a large box that basically allows sound to dissipate and neutralize and be measured over a time span. In the middle of this room, there's actually a rotating boom microphone that allows you to take a time span measurement of whatever source that you're trying to record. And from there, we can calculate things like insertion loss, sound pressure, sound power, and actually uh, accurately measure it. The opposite of a reverberant room is actually an anechoic chamber, which is basically completely absorptive. And we don't actually have an anechoic chamber at price today, but they're used primarily for having no reverberance or echo. 
And they're kind of interesting spaces that if you go into, you can actually hear your heart beating and people may not like spending a lot of time in there because it kind of gets- It is strange. Weird. It's a little bit strange, yeah. Is that that kind of room, is that standard for um, like standardized for testing uh, noise equipment? Good question. So we're going to look at that and we built the room in such a way that you're able to test down to very low frequency and up to very high frequency. But different people have labs across North America and the room isn't so much standard. The proportions, the width, the height, the length can be varied depending on the space available. We've built our room to be able to measure down to 50 hertz and up to 10,000 hertz. And it works very well for that purpose. Yeah, I was, I was interested in wondering about that too, because I, I just saw a sound room like that um, last week. Mm. I went to uh, Lauren Cook, okay. uh, uh, ventilation manufacturer yeah. uh, in Springfield, Missouri. And they had a room pretty much exactly like you're describing. Awesome. Yeah. And a lot of manufacturers will have different rooms and they're tested to different standards or set up for different sound measurement mm -hmm. reasons. But it's, uh, it's a great space and kind of needed to do the work that we do. So I'm actually gonna play a video here and I'm gonna cross my fingers the technology works with the Zoom and everything. But this is Mauricio Salinas on my team. He's our application engineering manager and he's gonna do a bit of a walkthrough on the fan room and some of the, the areas of the lab that we have here. Hello everyone, welcome to the sound lab here at Price Research Center North in Winnipeg. Today I'm gonna to take you through a tour highlighting some noise control products. To start, we're gonna speak about acoustical panels. In front of you and behind me and around you, you'll see a four inch thick acoustical panel. You might think how interesting is just to have a box made out of acoustical panels. Well, I'll tell you that it is very interesting indeed. Uh, number one, they provide performance for sound transmission class. So when you think about noise isolation, blocking a certain amount of sound from one side of the wall to the next, you think acoustical panels. Number two, absorption coefficients. So when you have a conference room, for example, and you wanna add absor absorptive element to the room, you think acoustical panels. They can be customized with different materials, stainless steel, aluminum, galvanized, you name it. They can be painted with powder coat or wet paint as well. Another feature of acoustical panels is that they come in two main construction designs. That is tongue and groove and each channel. What you have around me here is a tongue and groove design. It's an interlocking design that minimizes the number of fasteners used to install the acoustical panels, saving about 15% in labor when they are installed. They ship loose, knock down to be installed by the contractor. You will get a very specific installation manual that's going to tell you where each of these acoustical panels are to be located. Additional features to acoustical panels, additional to performance, is the ability that Price Industries has to customize each of the acoustical panels. If you look at the top, you'll see that we have angle corner panels to minimize the number of connections and flashing within an enclosure. We also offer wall mount panels, so if you have an existing wall and you want to add absorption, you add an acoustical wall mount panel as well. You could have cutouts to allow for lighting, you could integrate marine lights as well, and all to simplify the installation of an enclosure. Enclosures are used, as the name calls it, to enclose mechanical equipment, noisy equipment. It could be also used as ceiling panels or mixing plenums. Finally, let me just highlight the use of our corner panels that will minimize the amount of connections and flashing keeping an enclosure airtight to prevent any noise leakage or to prevent any moisture to come into the space. This is acoustical panels and I'd like to invite you to the next section of the lab. Please follow me. So Mauricio is pretty rigid on camera. He's kind of a wild <laughs> one. Do these videos anyway. Another section of the Price Sound Lab. Behind me, I have an acoustical louver, airfoil style, that offers a very attractive way to provide airflow to mechanical equipment while adding sound attenuation. Acoustical louvers are pretty neat as they come in different materials, such as aluminum, 
the finish that you see in front of you is a mill finish, aluminum finish. Acoustical louvers also come with different features, such as bird screens, filters, and they can be integrated with acoustical panels to serve as a plenum for an optimal integrated solution. What you see in front of you is a combination of silencers, acoustical panels, and acoustical louvers to provide an optimal solution to a noise control problem. This is a typical solution for a generator room, for example, at the discharge. You have the fan behind emitting noise. You have to attenuate it with ducted performance, insertion loss for silencers. You have absorption added with acoustical panels, but also noise isolation, which means you're trapping all the noise from breaking out of the plenum space. And finally, to allow for airflow to leave the room, you have acoustical louvers that can be used as access as well and customized to come up with that integrated solution to a complex problem. Let me also highlight that we have a different design for acoustical louvers. Up to my left, you'll see what we call the flat blade acoustical louver. Different design, but also aerodynamically tested to provide maximum sound attenuation while keeping pressure drop low. We could match any finish. As you could see behind me, we have the acoustical louver specifically designed to match the look of the building. Finally, speaking about panels, integrated solutions and acoustical panels, above my head, you'll see an acoustical mixing plenum box, typically used below a rooftop unit where you're dumping air to supply into the space. Acoustical panels such as the one above me are rated up to 10 inches of static pressure with no leakage whatsoever. Let me highlight that acoustical louvers also offer engineering performance tested as per ASTM E90 for sound transmission class and also for water penetration under AMCA 511. So in short, a quick demonstration of some noise control products used to come up with neat solutions to a complex noise issue. Yeah, so kind of a quick overview of some of the area of the lab. We have a sound room generating all of that air for our testing. And then all of that sound energy that we're using to create the air for the test is actually attenuated in all those louver silencers plenums to get down into the actual reverberant chamber. So the next video here is actually on the reverberant sound chamber where we take all our sound measurements. And it's a quick overview of what this space is about. Sound chamber here at Price Industries. The room is fabricated from eight recast concrete walls and contains a space of 21,000 cubic feet. It weighs over 750,000 pounds and is completely isolated from the rest of the building. The room is also sitting on springs to prevent any vibration or sounds from entering the room. The room is qualified to ANSI standards for taking sound measurements down to 50 hertz and up to 10,000 hertz. It's also comprised of STC 55 rated access doors, as well as a large 20 foot long silencer bank to ensure that no sound enters into the space that is not expected. We use the room for testing a variety of noise control products and other air moving products to test to the latest standards and ensure accurate, repeatable data. Yeah, so that's kind of a quick overview on the reverb room. Um, something that we've done and we spend a lot of time and sort of energy on is ensuring that our lab is testing accurately to the latest standards. And as part of this testing, noise control products don't really have a certified ratings program or governing body that actually approves that our data is done accurately and competently to the latest standard. What we've done is we've actually gone to a third party accreditation called NAVLAP or NVLAP, and they basically come in annually to check that our lab is operating under the conditions that we say that it is and testing to the latest ASTM standard. We hold this certificate kind of proudly that our lab is able to do acoustical testing to that latest standard. And we ensure that all of our equipment and our uh, devices within the lab are calibrated accurately. 
Um, we're currently certified and accredited for three different designations. The ASTM E477 is the one, and then also an ISO and an ANSI standard for determining sound power levels of different types of equipment. This is sort of an important thing in noise control because a lot of legacy manufacturers and differing competitors of ours don't go to the same extent or the same level of detail to ensure that the products are tested to what the latest standard dictates. Something that we found, and you mentioned uh, Cook has a lab as well, and there's many different types of labs across North America. We're one of the few manufacturers that create and measure noise control products that actually has NABLAP accreditation for acoustical testing, which is sort of a good thing. We really hold this certification and accreditation proudly, and we want to make sure we're kind of a leader in this industry for testing to the latest standards. Another thing that I'll mention is that we're actually currently the only manufacturer of noise control products that has this accreditation. There has been others in the industry over the past you know, 30, 40 years that have gone to the extent to get this accreditation. But more recently, many of these manufacturers have either discontinued or eliminated their ability to test noise control products. One of our competitors, Vibroacoustics, had accreditation, but it was actually suspended and eliminated from their capabilities last year in 2022 when they moved locations and actually lost primary usage of their lab and they no longer have a testing lab for that intention. So they're all cheaters. No, we're not saying that. We're not saying that. We're saying that, you know, we don't know. Sound is sensitive and the standards that we're expected to follow are quite stringent. And we want to make sure, at least in our own capabilities, we're following them accurately. The standard that we primarily follow is ASTM E477-20. And the reason I just wanted to mention this and the reason for the NAVLAP accreditation and checking our competencies is that this standard is very specific around the way that noise control products are manufactured and tested and cataloged for performance. And we'll often see, you know, the noise control marketplace in North America is quite broad. There's many different manufacturers of devices and products, but not all are created equal. Not everyone is testing to the latest standard that really dictates the way the product needs to be inserted, installed, calibrated, measured, recorded, cataloged. This latest version, the Dash 20, was created and released in 2020. Previously to this standard, there was multiple revisions in 2013, 1999, 1973, 1960, so on and so forth. There was many different revisions and over time, over the legacy of the standard, it's got more stringent, more restrictive. The latest revision moving from the previous 2013 version to 2020 through you know seven years of research and revision, the latest standard has got a lot more tight and stringent on what's allowable and acceptable for what we call repeatability and reproducibility. And if you look at these tables, again, 63 to 8,000 hertz, the older version had a very wide range of what was acceptable. On reproducibility, it was actually 16 dB at 63 hertz and a range of 4 to 12 from the rest of the octobands, which is a very broad range. On the latest revision, this has been tightened quite substantially so that you can't have you know, plus or minus 10 dB in every octaband, which is a good thing. And through a series of round robin testing where one silencer was manufactured and sent to a lot of these different labs and results were compared, these tolerances have been tightened quite substantially, which is a good thing. And we really believe in and we follow the latest standard for that reason, that we want it to be accurate and that the, the information that we're publishing and we have in our software is actually attainable in practical installation. Does you know, that make sense? You guys follow me? Yeah. It's kind of an important part that because noise control products don't have like a certified ratings program, what we go by is following the latest standard and that NAVLAP accreditation to show that we're doing it accurately. 
Hey, just a quick question. Yeah. We didn't cover this on Tuesday, but I know that like in the past there was a I said like a legacy silencer and a new silencer, like what's, and I, and I know historically there have been silencer manufacturers who overstated their insertion losses. Yep. What's the, so those are not E20 um, or whatever, AS that 447-20, I know that's not it, but Correct. even before 2013, some other manufacturer testing to it, Looser standard or correct? Remember, what's the so this is like, hey, if you still specify IEC from 100 years ago, exactly. And and we used to basically allow a reduction to an older standard, like a legacy standard. And there was a, a revision back in 1999 and then 1984. And when you go back generations, the standard was very loose. And it allowed people to do things sort of to optimize their performance better than you would ever achieve in a real world installed situation. And, you know, some manufacturers like IAC have been around for 50, 60, 75 years. They tested a lot of their performance back in the 70s, the 80s. And that performance was no longer applicable to these latest standards. We've now updated all of our data, all of our performance to this 2020 standard. Does it equal, you know, an IAC silencer that was tested in 1974? Not always, but is it more accurate? Is it appropriate? Yes. I think it was, wasn't it that they based everything on an even aspect ratio silencer? So like, oh, Correct. I'm gonna test a 24 by 24, but I'm gonna build a 36 by 12 and assume that that's gonna Apply perform it. exactly the same, even though, the geometry is com completely different. Yeah. Am I barking up the right tree? You're dead on. And there was a lot of, you know, variances. It allowed for transition is, transitions in the ductwork. So you could build a silencer and just hard transition to it and then test it under that transition. The latest standard has eliminated the ability to do some of that stuff. Um, so it's, it's just a lot more accurate based on the science and what we know today. And it's a good thing. And, and quite honestly, we're very transparent with performance data. We set up numerous mock-ups every year in our lab, and we have that accreditation so that we can do that. We can build a sample, bring in witness testing. Um, we're very transparent, and we're confident that the data we show on our submittals for dynamic insertion loss is accurate and achievable, whereas some of the other manufacturers in the industry have very old data that I don't know how they stand behind, to be honest. It's, it's a complicated sort of convoluted process. Um, tough to see on this image, but again, we reference that latest standard and all of the performance data that we have is based on testing to it. You need a magnifying glass to see that maybe. One other thing I wanted to mention that's kind of interesting to me is there's a manufacturer that has released performance data called IMI, IMI Acoustics. They're, they build silencers and they have performance data that's been a little bit suspicious. And there's a few people within the industry that have kind of come together, including some of our competitors and others, to look at this data and say, this, this just does not seem right. The performance that's been published is sort of astronomically high. And this is one of their units, you know, it's under 20 inches in length. So we're talking a very short silencer and they're publishing it at over 30 dB at 63 Hertz and then very high insertion loss at the low and high frequencies. Typically when you look at insertion loss, it has a bit of a bell curve to it. Lower insertion loss and in low frequencies and lower in the high and then sort of mid frequency uh, attenuation. When you compare, the performance to something like an eight inch thick concrete block, it's actually lower than what the silencer is proving to achieve. And it just, it didn't seem feasible. And a lot of concern in the industry kind of came up saying, what is going on here? Comparatively to a 10 foot long price silencer, you can see we're achieving about 27 dB. And it just, it didn't seem right. And what happened is information came out that there was actually some fishy stuff going on with falsifying test reports. And because a lot of these labs don't have 
testing chambers and nav lab accreditation. They send products to be tested to third party labs like Intertech or Riverbank. And they actually released a public notification that you should immediately stop using any product procured by using these falsified test reports. And what happened was it appears they were actually applying the wide range of that testing tolerance to their performance data. So under laboratory conditions, they would measure something like 14 dB at 63 Hertz, but they would actually add that full 16 dB to it to get up to some astronomical value. So this is why those test standards and accreditation are so important because it allows sort of the wild west of being able to do whatever you want with your data. And then it's, it's just not physically possible. Hey, we're going to, hey, hold one, one second. Hey, those of you watching remotely, we're not seeing a lot of questions. So I'm challenging you to raise your level. And if you're doing something else, let's dial in here. But uh, there's 24 of you, so I'm expecting to see a few more. Thanks, everybody. Next question is going to be, why is Tom so mean? <laughs> okay, we're going to move forward here and switch gears a little bit over to the topic of acoustic analysis. And this is sort of an exciting part of noise control in our business is being able to analyze projects and designs before they go into construction. Traditionally, acoustic analysis is used for acoustically modeling a mechanical system, whether it's indoor, outdoor, supply, return, radiated noise, to understand how that sound is going to impact kind of the environment or the occupied space you're primarily concerned with. I'm going to share a quick video here again, just because videos are fun. And this will give you a little bit of an overview of what acoustic analysis is. Acoustic analysis is used to predict the sound levels in a given space. In the commercial HVAC industry, there are a variety of acoustic environments, from operating rooms to auditoriums and everything in between. Each different environment has its own characteristics, challenges, and acoustic design goals. For example, classrooms have strict sound requirements so that teachers can communicate easily with students. Medical spaces typically have many hard surfaces and therefore are acoustically live, meaning that sound reverberates within the room longer than acoustically dead spaces. And offices and conference rooms require privacy so that confidential conversations are not overheard. The key to controlling noise in any application is understanding the three main elements of sound transfer. The source, the path, and the receiver. The source is the origin of the sound. This could be mechanical equipment such as fans, chillers, and air handlers, people talking, or road noise. The path is how the sound is transmitted. There are three main paths. Structure-borne, where sound moves through a wall, floor, or foundation. Airborne, where sound radiates through space. And duct, where sound is transmitted through ductwork coming from equipment or an adjacent room. The receiver observes the sound. How the sound is perceived will depend on their proximity to the source, the type of space, and the number of sound sources. Based on the characteristics of the source, path, and receiver, the sound experienced by the receiver can be predicted for any space. Historically, this was done either by hand or with a spreadsheet and countless calculations. The acoustic analysis software from Price greatly simplifies the process and reduces the risk of Okay, do we want to run the poll maybe right now? Yep. Yeah, let's do it. So we're going to ask a quick poll. Have you ever used an acoustic analysis tool, whether it's the Price tool or otherwise? Just kind of curious on a broad sense. Looks like there's quite a few yeses actually, which is Great to see. Chris, on your screen, can you close it out? Yeah, just the pull box. There you go. Okay. Okay, so a pretty good spread. Seven yeses, six noes, and three not yets. All right. Five people doing something else. <laughs> Five waiting to get to it. So in general, 
Acoustic analysis is a very powerful tool, and you may not need to use it on every project every time, but when you're working on a sound sensitive application or application of a space, you can utilize this procedure and this tool and the software to be able to do this. Whether it's you know, a performing art space that has very stringent background sound levels, a commercial building space, a boardroom or an office, hospital and healthcare spaces or educational spaces often have very stringent criteria to be able to achieve background sound levels. Something else we've seen is that if you can prove and predict acoustics within a space, there's lead credits available for doing that. Um, certain engineers are really involved with lead and getting lead credits on projects or buildings. And acoustics does have credits available for achieving you know, proper background sound levels within things like educational spaces and classrooms. And we've seen certain areas of the country interested in achieving those lead credits and being able to do that through the power of acoustic analysis. In general, when we refer to spaces, we use terminology like dead or alive. It seems a little bit morbid and I'm not sure you know, where that came from, but in general, a live space is something that's very reflective, reverberant, like a reverberant chamber. A dead space is very absorptive, like a theater, plush carpeting, fabrics, liners, materials, textiles. In practical construction, most spaces fall somewhere in between dead and live. I mentioned yesterday, what would this space be? This would lean more towards live because high ceilings, exposed roof deck, tile flooring, but there is some acoustical absorption. The fabric, the textile within the space helps reflect and absorb that noise. Something a person brought up in one of these presentations for me was, what would a morgue be like in a hospital where you, know, you see on CSI or something? Well, a morgue would actually be live. Well, that's weird terrible. sort of uh, consideration, but I didn't know you were going there until you went there. So. Yeah, it's the opposite of what you think. So dead doesn't mean dead, like a morgue. It's a very <laughs> weird kind of thought, but a live space has hard surfaces, like a hospital, a surgical suite, whereas a, a dead space would be absorptive. So a good way to think of it is morgues are actually live. It's a bad joke. <laughs> You your 10 year old daughter would call that. Laughs call that a dad yeah. joke. My daughter likes jokes like that, maybe, but I'm a dad. What can I say? When we look at acoustics and noise control, and I really encourage everyone to take this away from today. If there's one single thing you remember, remember this that whenever you're dealing with a sound problem, think of these three elements. What is the source of the noise? What is the path in which it transmits? And who or what is the receiver? And if you can understand these three elements, you can really start working towards a solution to solve a noise problem. The source is somewhat the most important. You need to know what's creating the noise. How loud is it? Where is it located? What's the sound power? The path can be simple or complicated depending on the project or the application. And the receiver is usually somebody that's complaining or will complain if the space is not meeting the desired intent. When you break the problem down into its elements, you have to consider all of the specifics around these things. Like we learned about earlier, the source usually has sound power, LW associated with it. It's going to be a mechanical piece of equipment primarily, or it could be people, it could be you know, some environmental consideration, but something like an air handler, a chiller, a thermal unit, a generator, a pump, a fan, whatever. The path is gonna be how that sound energy is actually being transmitted. Often in HVAC, it's the ductwork, but it could be just a distance. It could be a wall, it could be a ceiling, it could be some sort of path transmission. And then finally, the receiver. What or who is going to be bothered by this noise? Is it a classroom? Is it a conference room? Is it a property line? A distance, you need to be able to understand that. From there, the path is often where you spend a lot of your time doing the analysis. The source is relatively well defined. It's going to have, you know, a fan from a manufacturer with the sound power. 
The receiver is usually well-defined. It's at a certain distance. It's a certain building element, a classroom. The path can be complicated depending on, there may be multiple paths. A typical room will have multiple paths. It'll have supply air, it'll have return air, it'll have maybe radiated noise. And each of these needs to be modeled or understood when doing an analysis. Again, the path could be multifaceted, structure born, airborne, or duct born, depending on how sound is going to be transmitted. And you'll have to understand, you know, what is your primary concern? Some may not be of concern. Maybe it's only the supply and the return you're worried about. Others may be all structure born noise where you have vibration issues within a space or structure born noise generation. Traditionally, when you do an acoustic analysis, it's quite tedious and it takes time and effort to numerically calculate from your source down to your receiver what's happening acoustically with that problem. You always start with your source primarily where you take your sound power LW of your mechanical device and that would be the starting point of the sound path analysis. From there, you actually deduct the elements. And in this case, you'd have an elbow, a junction, some straight duct. Different types of ductwork have different attenuation values. And the ductwork that you're modeling is usually referenced from some sort of industry standard handbook or publication to know what these would be. And there's a wide variety of references like ASHRAE, like noise control fundamentals handbooks on what the size and construction and length and width and airflow are going to yield for deductions. And that's where that's coming from primarily. Finally, you're left with your room and your space itself, which again, is it live? Is it dead? Is it medium live? Is there a carpet? There'll be deductions associated with that type of space. Once you've done this, you're basically left with your sound pressure level, LP, on your estimated sound level for that space. And again, this can be quite powerful. And if you're concerned with the background sound in the space and you can estimate your sound pressure, what could you do with that? Anyone have an idea? What do you do with your sound pressure level? Room criteria? Bingo. I would plot it on an NC curve. <laughs> you got it. Well done. Yeah. You can determine your room criteria. You could take those sound pressure levels and put it on a, car, a curve. Was there a question? Um, there is. Cassidy's going to put it up on the screen. Just shut. Off. Got a quick question coming in. Good question. So that picture has reminded me of an ultra suite we expect for ORs. Never personally seen the finished installed product or witness sound in those rooms. Are there any acoustic concerns with using them? How loud can an OR be before it's a problem? So the ultra suite is a operating room ventilation and lighting system that's available. And, you know, hospitals, like we mentioned, are live spaces and there is sound considerations around things like the ventilation system in an operating room. The ultra suite itself does have sound levels associated with it. There is sound data and testing that have been done on that assembly. And it really depends on the specifics around the airflow, the size, the space. And something like acoustic predictive analysis can be used on a hospital operating room system with the ultra suite system installed. Um, is it a problem? Often not. You know, something I've heard and I've seen is that sometimes being too quiet gives the perception that the product is not functioning to its utmost ability. And what I mean by that is when you want air returning, you sort of want to be able to hear that fan sucking air out. Um, you don't want it to be utmost silence. The ultra suite typically doesn't have a lot of sound power associated with it because it's a diffuser system itself. There's not a lot of source noise in there. The source is often upstream of that ultra suite before you know the HEPA filters and the diffusers from the actual supply fan or wherever it's getting ventilated from, which might need a noise control 
right? Solution. So if you were doing a super critical analysis of an operating room using a laminar flow diffuser system, you'd have to look at the air handling system from the supply and the return path. Correct. And the terminal boxes serving that space, probably supply and return. And you'd probably just look at the diffuser selection, right? You wouldn't put that in the you could a place for it. You could put it in at like the end of your analysis as like an sure. element. Sure. But typically something else in the system will overpower the sound level of the actual the diffuser. diffuser. Sure. It'll be the fan or the terminal box or whatever upstream. Right. Again, using that source path receiver concept, I think the ultra suite could be a good case study example of how you could model it acoustically. You could use the data from that. Um, so great question. And I mean, the ultra suite is one example, but there's many others similar to that. Like a fan filter unit is another example where you have maybe a, a pharmaceutical facility using fan filter units at the source and there's multiple within the space. Those also are sound generating devices that have a fan and a filter kind of assembly. Actually, I've got a good analogy. So your lab has a huge fan system in it. We didn't show any pictures of it, but there's a big vein axial fan in there. Right. And so theoretically, because we're using a speaker to project the sound into the silencer to compare with and without, we have this huge fan. Do we need to attenuate the entire fan out of the system? No, we just have to attenuate it down to the point that it's logarithmically negligible, right? Within 10 dB, right. Within, yeah, so yeah. once we get it down to, so usually sound path from an air handler problem often makes a VAV box in a diffuser negligible. Right. So we usually Something just is look at the path, it. right? Yeah. But if you did a deep, deep dive, Andrew, um, we can look at all those different sources. Right. We do have a couple more questions. Okay. Yeah. We got to give tickets too. I'm really bad at these ticket giving. Yeah, so if you're keeping track of who's asking, we'll give them tickets. Who are these anonymous attendees? Identify yourselves. <laughs> so great question. You have a particular tool or measuring device that you would recommend for troubleshooting noise issues after a project is complete, what would you recommend measuring DBA, each octave band or something else? So this is a bit of a loaded question. Um, there is some amazing sound measuring devices available in the industry, but they're quite expensive. And everybody in this world is cost conscious, whether you're a consulting engineer, a private homeowner, or a manufacturer. And you can buy handheld sound meters for you know, 10, 15, $20,000. It will give you extremely accurate results in one third octave bands and record every piece of data you could ever imagine. But usually the price point is unachievable for most, including us at price. You can't buy you know, multi $20,000 sound meters. It's just not possible. Thankfully, because of technology, there's a lot of less expensive sound meters available in the industry that you can buy either as standalone devices or accessories to things like smartphones and iPads, where there's actually external microphones you can plug into your access ports or uh, whatever the things are called on iPhones and actually get really accurate measurements using downloadable software with an external microphone. I've got several sound measuring apps on my phone and they give you like a general, you know, DB level within a space. If you turn it on in here, you might get, you know, 40 to 50 DB, but they're not super accurate. Ideally, you need something that can measure in octave bands. You can get that spectrum of sound like this here. And if I go back a slide, being able to get these, oops, being able to get these sound pressure levels are what's really critical. If you're worried about a project being complete and going to site to measure, there's uh, this is what you need. Eight octave band sound pressure levels. A couple names I'll just throw out. Rule and Car, B and K, make some of the best noise measurement instrumentation available in the industry, but at a certain price point, they can get quite expensive. There is another company that we've worked with in the past called Studio 6, Studio 6 Digital. They have an app you can download from the Google or Apple stores, 
and also external microphones you can buy for several hundred dollars, not thousand. And uh, I would recommend checking them out, Studio Six. I'm sure they have a website or store you can look at. Some great questions here. Again, I'm not great with these ticket handing out, but I'm hoping maybe you can jot down who they are. Um, what potential methods to mitigate sound vibration in food processing spaces would be highly cleanable and not be vulnerable to caustic cleaning agents? A frequent challenge we have for customers is the noise, the hygienic air units making difficult to communicate. So this is something we see not just in food processing, but also electronics manufacturing, kitchen exhaust, uh, lab, fume hoods, all sorts of sort of sensitive, caustic, corrosive environments. Usually, tactless silencers work very well, where there's actually no acoustic media, all metal construction. We're going to touch on that in the next section. And we'll have provisions for cleanability, where there's access doors, there's drain ports that you can actually get into, you can wash out. And they can work very well for that intent. We've seen them used primarily in things like grease duct, kitchen exhaust, food processing, where you're worried about the noise, but also the cleanability of those units. So kind you, of, can, um, you can build out of a variety of materials and construct in continuous welded, all that kind of. You bet. So, And we're going to, the last section is going to be more on noise control products. I'll touch on and I'll explain a little further in that section here. Great questions. I appreciate the engagement online crew. So once we've got the sound pressure, as we mentioned, you could plot that on an NC curve. These blue dots on this standardized NC curve would show that we're at NC 65 in that space, which is extremely loud for maybe an office space. You wouldn't be very happy spending eight hours in there. Once you've done this, what you can actually do is determine how much sound reduction is necessary to get down to NC40? In this case, the vertical orange lines would depict dropping each of those eight octobands down an appropriate amount to get down to NC40. And the table at the bottom sort of summarizes your requirement for what we call insertion loss. This is what you would need the minimum values a silencer to provide to get down to NC40. And this is often where you see, you know, a consultant, an acquisition will say, must meet these values for this RTU1 return path. That's where insertion loss comes from. That's what silencers are selected to do, is to mitigate that sound of that air handler down to those levels. Tying this all together, what we've done at Price is we've developed a software that allows a user to do this very accurately and quickly without you know, having six different handbooks and spreadsheets and calculators open, you can do this using price acoustic predictive software. And it's a very powerful acoustical modeling tool. I'm gonna to do a quick demo of today, but if you are interested in this, if you're working on you know, a theater project and you're worried about background sound levels, I encourage you to try it. It's not complicated and you don't have to be an acoustician, but if you're you know, a designer, a mechanical engineer, an architect, an acoustician, or even a contractor, there's a lot of value in using this tool. A couple other points is that this isn't new either. Some of you may have already used it or downloaded it. We released it back in 2014, and it's been perfected and revised over the years to make it even better. We also offer a complimentary acoustic analysis service that we can help you guys with this sort of thing. Talk to your team at Airflow, connect with us um, at Price. We've got a team of application engineers that do this day in and day out to help mitigate sound and analyze projects to ensure they're meeting guidelines. We've also got thousands of users and we're looking for more because we want feedback and we wanna perfect this tool to be one of the best in the industry, which I truly believe it already is. And then finally, it's very user friendly. You don't have to be you know, an acoustical scientist to be able to use it. It's quite easy to manipulate. And then finally, and maybe best of all, it's free. We don't charge for it. You can download it off the website. We don't make you license it or approve any sort of credit card payments where a lot of the others are quite expensive. 
The tool itself is a desktop based tool. It's not web based like Word or Excel or other tools you're familiar with, where you can actually download it on your desktop, save files in your folders, and email them to coworkers or sales representatives or manufacturers for review. There's a few things you need to be able to do or collect before you do an analysis, like find the sound power and determine the path and understand what you're trying to achieve before you kind of jump right in. Usually when you do an analysis, you start with something like this, and you guys are probably familiar with looking at, you know, Revit or AutoCAD or just PDF plan layouts, understanding the path of sound and marking it up to understand, you know, what is this space going to be once things go into construction? And using all that information, you can model it in this acoustic analysis tool to be able to understand and predict the sound levels within these spaces. Once you've performed an analysis, you can also generate a lot of great information, things like acoustic analysis reports, product submittals for anything necessary to achieve your goals, and project-specific specifications can be easily generated with a few clicks of the button. We also have a lot of users of this tool. Some big firms and names in the industry for acoustic consulting and engineering. And like I mentioned, I'd love to add the firms that you guys are employed by and that you work at to this list and find value in it. And uh, you may already have companies in your own market today that have downloaded and are using it. Is there a question? Uh, yeah. I saw something pop up there. Good so, question, Dan. So Tom asked a similar question. For a VAV system, do you just ignore the VAV or what about fan powered? So hang tight, I'll show you how you can handle that. Um, you can add it into the analysis if you feel it's going to be an issue. But as you learned earlier with logarithmic addition of sound, sometimes the air handler unit will be at 70 dB and the VAV will be at 50. And because of that 10 dB variance between the sound sources, it may not be uh, appropriate. It might be negligible, but sometimes it is important and you have to add it into the analysis. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. I'm going to give you a ticket for that. I already got it. You got it? Okay. Remind me if I forget, because I'm juggling too many balls here. I keep forgetting. So there's a few other tools available, and I'll just touch on them quickly. So you may be familiar with one, and you may have used it or not. But comparing the price tool to a few others, Dynasonics and Potterf had a tool. It was called AIM, Information Acoustic Modeling. It was actually a really well-designed and developed tool. But unfortunately, it was discontinued back in 2019. Potter kind of closed their noise control division and sold off that line, and they no longer have access available or it's being updated or downloadable. And a lot of users that were familiar with it moved over to the price tool at that point. Train has a tool called the TAP program, Train Acoustics program. It's also quite well built. It is a little bit archaic and outdated. The user interface leaves a little bit to be desired. I've used it myself for years. And uh, it is kind of expensive. It's $500 per license plus an annual service fee, which I don't know, I don't like spending money on software if I don't need to. And then finally, Vibro Acoustics does have a tool as well called VA Design. I've never personally used it, but something I hear feedback a lot from consultants is that it's a web-based tool. You have to log into their servers and their network to gain access to it, which can be a little bit troublesome if you're working on, you know, a sensitive project, you have an NDA, your intellectual property may not be your own. Um, I've heard people don't like that. And ours is a desktop based tool you don't have to be worried about. So again, it's a free download from our website. One of the benefits is it's actually integrated into our all in one for engineering software, which also has other tools within it, like product selections and calculators that might also come in handy for you. I think Ruskin had one too, but that's been discontinued. I think it was called Snap. Uh, Maybe Andrew just put that in the chat also. Oh, okay. I haven't used that one, but maybe if anyone has feedback on it, good or bad, I'd be interested. I have feedback. One. It's not positive. So. Okay. Maybe I should add it to the list. And, and, I'm, and I want you to know, like, I'm not trying to dump on our competitors here. Um, I just want to give you the information 
that I receive, and I do a lot of these presentations and training with people. And something that we've done with the price tool is, although that we've developed the code and the interface and our software engineers have actually created it, the content and the framework of the tool is being pulled from all the industry experts and uh, users that really tell us what they need it to do. Awesome, thank you. And for example, the deductions in the software aren't coming from price specifically. They're being referenced from ASHRAE, from all of the experts in the field. I'm just gonna take a quick look at the time here and I'm gonna, okay, let's go through this section and then we'll jump into an actual demo. So something I like to play a game with you guys on is that we talked about decibels and NCRC, DBA, sound power, sound pressure earlier. But in general, humans are sensitive to sound, but at some level of sound level change, there's you know, imperceptibility that happens. And what I mean by that is most people can't tell the difference between one or two or even three dB audibly. A one decibel difference, you know, 45 compared to 46 dB is not a big deal. Likewise for insertion loss, and we see this a lot when an engineer will review a submittal or a schedule and reject somebody over a one or two dB difference, which in most cases is not perceptible. 3 dB is typically the threshold of just being noticeable. There's an audio audible difference between 27 and 30 dB. Interestingly though, a 10 dB difference is a big deal because of that logarithmic nature of sound. 10 dB is actually heard or perceived as twice as loud. So having a 10 decibel reduction going from 50 to 40 dB is kind of a big deal. 20 dB, four times, 30 dB, eight times as loud. And I don't know about you guys, but eight times as loud is kind of hard to perceive. Like, what is that? Must be very loud. So 30 dB is kind of a big deal. So I'm gonna play a game with you and it's called, Can You Hear the Difference? So I'm gonna play three different audio clips. Hopefully this works through Zoom and all the setup we have here. And I want you to kind of see if you can understand what is the audible difference. Identify these three audio clips. There's gonna be a one dB change, a three dB change, and a 10 dB change. Remember the slide previously, what's perceptible, what's not. And uh, let's try this, this'll be fun, right? Yeah, two band guys in here, so they this should this game should get challenged. Bear with me while I navigate. I won't play the answer key. So something I'm going to do to warm up our ears is play some other sounds to make sure my audio is working and you guys can hear this. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Someone on the chat, maybe just comment that they can hear that. You can hear it? Okay. So that's a hundred ton chiller. Uh, this is a mixed flow fan. Kind of annoying if you had to listen to that all day. Let's play the first example and see if you can identify it. playing is it's on and then it's off and then it's on and then it's off and that difference between on and off is the decibel change so, so, so. i'll play it one more time okay, 
that's the first one. This is going to be the second one. Okay, and this will be the third one. So there's kind of three examples there. It gets a little echoey here. It didn't play quite as well as I hope, so hopefully you can make that out. But any guesses? One, two, three. Okay, Jacob's up. Um, the order that I think I ran is the first one is a 10 decibel, second one is a three decibel, last one is the one decibel. You got it. Yeah. 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 And, and your speaker's still on on your on your laptop. Turn it up. Okay, here we go. Ten, and then three, and then one. Um, so it's ten is obviously very noticeable. It's either on or off. There's no refuting it. Two, you can hear it. Um, the audio may not be as loud as it was when I don't have it screen sharing. And then the one is almost negligible. You can barely tell an on and off. So kind of a quirky little example, but I really want you guys to understand that that three dB difference is not a big audible difference. I'm gonna give you another ticket here and we'll hit the person maybe on the call one too for getting there right there, whoever that was. All right, that was fun, right? Listening to white noise. So let's actually jump in and do a quick acoustic analysis here. Awesome. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, um, Did you wanna do a break? Maybe you wanna take a five minute break? Uh, are we at 11? Yeah, let's let's do a quick five minute break and then we'll come back. We'll run through the analysis and then wrap up with kind of a quick perfect product overview. All right. So 11.05, everybody. Hey, we the break. Can I get a, uh, a quick picture for social media? The resident social media gate here. We'll get, a, we'll get a group picture with Chris, with our attendees. Sure. All right. All right, we're back. If you hide that and jump in here. Okay, so for the purpose of today's acoustic analysis example, for sake of time, we've only got about 45 minutes left here. I'm not gonna get into everything and anything the software can do, but if you're curious, if you're interested, if you want a one-on-one, -on -one, let us know. Talk to your guys at Airflow or come to me directly. We'll set something up. We can do webinars, we can do project specific analysis and holding, but I wanna give you a flavor and a couple examples of what you can use this tool to do and really show how powerful it is. There was a question I think from Justin, was it? Yeah. About- uh, When downloading the prerequisite installer, I get a message about not being able to download securely. Should I be concerned? So I wouldn't be, I assure you, our intentions and servers and network is secure and we're not trying to download anything malicious on your computer. It might be something more on your local software or security system that's flagging. But uh, like I mentioned, we have thousands of downloads of it and it shouldn't be doing anything malicious. The first thing I'll mention and I'll kind of show here is if you're interested in the tool, where can you get it? Well, if you go to our website, priceindustries.com, if you go to the resources drop down here, the second one and software, this is really where the download can happen. It's under our software called Price All in One Software for Engineers, kind of in the middle here. And if you just click on that, it'll bring you to the download link. Um, all in one for engineers is a great tool where you can do, you know, grill and diffuser and thermal unit calculations and selections. But also, my favorite part is the acoustic analysis, which is kind of depicted in the middle here. And simply downloading on this, there's a couple of little steps you got to go through. I think you have to provide like an email address and a, a prerequisite installer, which basically shows that you're running a 
late version of Windows and not some um, Windows XP or something from 1999. But as long as your computer is relatively new and uh, can handle current software, you should be good to go. Once you download the tool, the first time you open it, it looks something like this here. So again, it's a pretty slick tool that you can download to your desktop. And at the top, there's a lot of different product selections and product lines you can delve deeper into. But for today, we're actually going to look at this acoustic analysis module. When you first open acoustic analysis, the tool will actually have this info overlay come up to give you some indication of what's going on with all this different real estate and tools. At the top, there's a wide variety of what we call ribbon tools, kind of similar like you'd have in Word or Excel, where you can select from different elements and properties. In the middle is where all your design work actually happens. And we build these acoustic path analysis in a vertical nature from source to receiver. On the right, there's a properties tab that actually shows what the relevant properties need to be. And you would key in all of your data over here. And then at the bottom right, there's a sound pressure level graph. And at the bottom, a summary of all the data that you've entered. So when you first open it again, something that I do is I kind of make the screen my own. I use two monitors on my computer, so you can pull and break out these different boxes and items if you like. Your sound pressure level graph is quite handy. Oops. I will often kind of leave it out there. And uh, yeah, you can kind of collapse and expand things as you prefer. So I'll just collapse that summary at the bottom there. Another thing I'll mention is that there's a help file at the top. And I don't know about you guys, but usually I ignore the help files in like Excel and Word. I don't really go in there and spend a lot of time researching how to do macros and stuff. But our help file is great. And I encourage a first time user to kind of glance through it. There's a lot of information in this help file, and it basically shows you and explains the references of where everything is coming from. How to properly do an acoustic analysis from your source all the way down to your receiver. It also gives you a lot of data on where these elements are coming from, the ash ray, the fundamentals of noise control, kind of publications that these are being pulled from, as well as the different deductions for things like uh, ductwork and liners and all of that. So if you're curious, take a peek in there. The first thing that I typically start with when doing an analysis, and really one of the most important things, is the source. What is making the noise? The source you can actually name, so you can give it a name. Maybe we'll call it, I don't know, train, air handler unit, one, two, three. No offense to train, they're a great company, but they're just in my mind for some reason. Tag, we'll call it air handler unit one. And notes, maybe we'll say this is the supply path one or something like that. From there, you can enter in your airflow. We'll say a thousand CFM. We'll keep it kind of low on the airflow for the purpose of this example, and I'll show you kind of why. And then you can actually then enter in your relevant sound power level, whether it's supply, return, or radiated noise. In this case, we're going to just have a simple supply path, and I'll key in that sound data here. Isn't it exciting watching someone key in data? While you're typing in that data, there is a question in the chat yeah. from Wes. Do you have retrofit solutions for large ductwork systems that have already been installed and are difficult to access? If yes, can the sound solutions be ordered in smaller customizable pieces? Would Ooh, it be easier juicy. to install in the future? So the answer is definitely yes. Something we've done exactly for that purpose. And if you didn't hear the question, it's basically asking, we've got a large system in place. Is there retrofit options to be able to install it easier than maybe a costly retrofit and pulling things apart? Something we've done successfully is provided standalone baffles that basically can be inserted into existing ductwork instead of you know, modular components or silencers, where if access to the ductwork can be possible and you can actually you know, cut or open up an area and slip baffles in, it can be a great option for that. Also, installing a more traditional silencer could be a potential if you have details around the project and plan layouts, loop us in. We can definitely come up with something. We do a lot of custom work, to be honest, in, in our department. 
because noise is often forgotten and becomes a real problem once buildings get occupied. So I'm just going to quickly switch back to the PowerPoint here. I didn't really talk about this, but this is the analysis we're going to try and do here, where we have a rooftop air handler unit and the connecting ductwork running across the hallway or the corridor and then branching into a single classroom space. So again, for the purpose of today's analysis, maybe an overly simplified system compared to reality, but it works well for showing the potential of the tools. At this point, we've entered the sound data of that air handler unit. Something you'll notice is it gives you a quick A-weighted sound power level. So this is in some ways a, a DBA calculator. And you can also, at this point, look at your sound pressure level curve. So in this case, we're quite loud. We're actually in excess of NC65, which could be a problem in a classroom. The next thing you would do is you actually model your path. So once you've started this path one analysis, if you click on new path element, kind of the beauty of the tool is that there's a library of elements you can select from. Things like ductwork or building elements, plenums, power splits, junctions, and so on. You can actually build your path from these elements. So let's start by clicking elbow, and we're actually gonna model an elbow piece of ductwork. You can add a tag or notes if you know something about that elbow. But in this case, let's just put in the dimensions 24 inch by 24 inch elbow piece of ductwork. Again, there's different types of elbow, radius, lined, unlined, and so on. We're just going to use a standard rectangular unlined piece of ductwork. From there, we're going to add another piece of ductwork. We'll call it a straight duct. One of the nice things with the tool is it carries forward what you've entered on the previous element. So in this case, the dimensions are already there because it knows the previous one was 24 by 24. We just key in a length, 20 feet of duct. We're then kind of going down that hallway to the end of that junction. And there's a variety of different types of junctions. If you're not certain on what you need, there's a lot of handy references built into the tool. If you just click on, show me some details on what that means, you can look at these different types of junctions and understand what they're intending and which one best suits your needs. In this case, it kind of looks like we're trying to do a key junction. We've got a feeder and then branching in two directions. So let's go with that. T junction. Again, dimensions are pulled forward. Airflow is also pulled forward from the previous element. And you can enter in whatever your next element would be. We're going to actually move to a circular duct, kind of leading over top of that classroom. And we'll say it's eight inches in diameter with half of that airflow going one way and then the other half going the other way. Next, we're going to have another piece of ductwork. In this case, it's going to be circular duct. We'll say it's unlined circular based on the ash rate deductions. And we're going to have 10 feet of that circular duct. And then finally, we're going to end our path with something called end reflection. End reflection is quite common where you have the termination of a duct and some sound energy is going to reflect back into the space and some will enter into the actual duct itself. At that point, we're left at the receiver, which will be that classroom. You can, again, add any information or we'll call it classroom 455. And from there, we're actually gonna model the classroom. We'll say the classroom is 30 feet by 30 feet by nine feet. The average distance to receiver is basically one person sitting directly below the ceiling diffuser. And then there'll be one source being that diffuser into the space. Again, you can depict the room type, whether it's live or medium or medium dead or medium live as needed. And there's a lot of different deduction types and room types you can model from. Again, referenced in the help file if you're curious what that means or what you should use most appropriately. But for a classroom, we're gonna say it's an average type of surfaces, commercial carpeting, acoustical seal, ceiling tiles. And at this point, we're left with our criteria. So what do we want to achieve? Handy, if you don't know, there's ASHRAE's guidelines right in the software. You can basically just go in, click on classroom, and it's going to apply that NC30 criteria to our target. So what have we done here? We've basically done source to receiver based on this simplified kind of mechanical system. 
air handler, ductwork into classroom space. Really easy to kind of populate within, you know, a couple minutes here. And Chris, just, you know, for my own, like, regurgitating things so I get it right, the classroom is basically like your fire example where you convert from sound power to sound pressure and the room makes that conversion. Correct. So all of the deductions leading up to the room are basically taking away your sound power from the source. When you're in the space and applying those room surfaces and you can actually see in the element at the bottom here, minus six, minus seven and so on, that's where you're converting to a sound pressure, sound pressure level. It's sort of a not super intuitive when you're using the calculator the first time. Yeah, agreed. Once you've got to this point, you can look at a few things. You can actually look at, you know, our summary, which is quite helpful. And at the bottom, you can see required insertion loss. And this is doing exactly as we learned earlier. It's taking our NC curve and it's saying, we're currently at this red line. We need to get down to that blue line. What's required to do that? Well, you need those insertion losses as presented there. Zero at 63, but quite a bit in the mid to high frequency ranges. So the, the power of the tool is really this next part here. Once you've done that, you can do a variety of things. What I like to do personally is I duplicate that path. Let's leave that current state untouched so we kind of know what we're dealing with. The train air handler down to classroom 455. One of the really powerful things with the tool is that we can add noise control products into our path analysis because we're actually in the price all-in-one software selection tool. If I take this elbow element and try and replace it with a silencer, what I can do is just disable that element. And then from our path options, we actually have the option to add a duct silencer. So let's add a duck silencer to that path and see if we can get down to our desirable goal. By doing that, you can actually configure an elbow to replace that duct element elbow. One of the really powerful things, as I mentioned, is all of the information you've entered in gets carried in here. Your dimensions, your airflow, your sound levels. So you don't really have to do a lot to select a silencer that's gonna to get to your values. You can manipulate your dimensions. You can sort of shorten up maybe your inlet leg here if it's a vertical installed elbow. You can change your material if it's aluminum, if it's stainless. Um, but at this point, you can basically hit search and it's gonna look through our silencer database to see if it can find something to get us to that NC30 criteria we're trying to achieve. When you hit search, you see a, a few values come up at the bottom. These are basically silencer options. And if you just double click on one of these, it's going to actually pull that silencer back into our analysis here. So if we expand our chart, what you'll actually see now is a green curve that showed it applied the insertion loss of that elbow, the sound reductions, to get down to that NC30 criteria. A question that came up a few times earlier today was what about VAV boxes? What if you had maybe a VAV box in this path, which is quite common and likely to happen on something like this? What you can do with that, and if I actually just switch over here, say if you're not familiar with the price single duct VAV box, these are what they kind of look like, and there's a lot of different options and performance available for single ducts. What you can do with single ducts is you can actually look at the catalog data for these type of products. And they'll often have this type of performance catalog for different unit sizes, different sound power, both radiated and discharged. And in this example, say if we had a unit like this with sound power levels as depicted, you can actually take these values and add them in to the acoustic analysis. One limitation right now, I will admit, is that you can't do it as easily as the silencer. You have to add these as custom elements. And custom elements are basically able to be added at the user's um, interest, whether it's a price element or otherwise. Maybe you have a terminal from 
another manufacturer, Titus or Kruger or Naylor or whoever, um, you can add that in here by basically adding a custom element and adding it as VAB123. And then you would add in those sound power levels as needed. Um, it's a little bit manual, but it can be very versatile for whatever element you need, whether it's you know an ultra sweet operating room system at your final point or a fan powered VAB box from Train or Daikin or Price or whoever. Uh, very powerful like that. Any questions on the tool? Again, I went through this super quickly, and uh, I encourage you to try and download it. Can you show the, it? can you pop up the path again? I'm just kind of curious. Like, so, you know, we should all be able to just kind of take a glance, the numerical path. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Uh. Sorry, it's my first time using a computer. There we go. And you can kind of see like where that sounds are going to apply here and the options you got are quite extensive. This is a high performing, relatively large elbow silencer to get down to those levels that we needed to achieve. So in this case, the box would actually, could actually drive it because the box, if you go back to the website. Right. There was quite high discharge sounds, so like 76, 70, right. 61. So here's a case where, oh boy, we should definitely take a look at it versus, and of course, that's a box at max flow. Right. You could look even deeper and find the charts that show the three inch pressure drop and the two inch and the one and a half and all right. that. Yeah, so your first box off the air handler might have three inch pressure drop in the sound power on it is bananas. And that's the case of, gee, your VAV box is loud. Well, the amper's almost shut. Right. But you can extrapolate that out of the catalog, dump it in, and away you go. Another thing, like I mentioned earlier, maybe you need one with the silencer where it's lower sound power levels at the discharge because it has that integral sounds for applied. Um, another thing I'll just quickly show here is a lot of people use this tool for a quick you know, gut check. If you have say a generator and the generator is outside of your home or whatever, um, maybe it doesn't even have airflow and you're worried about how loud is it gonna be at a certain distance away. If you enter in, you know, 90 decibels as your generator noise source, and you use something like an outdoor receiver at a distance, what is this gonna be at 50 feet away? You can do that in a matter of seconds, putting in the sound power of the generator and a single point source distance. It's a very, very powerful tool for that purpose where this isn't, you know, an indoor classroom, it's just a generator at a distance. And, uh, you may need something like a barrier wall where you can actually add a barrier between that generator and you can add things like, what is the distance from the source to the receiver? You can say it's 50 feet. Um, and here, the distance. Chris, while you're entering that in, yeah. um, Randy put a comment and I presume the calculation changes as the duct sizes change. Uh, for example, 50, 500 CFM with an eight inch round would generate velocity noise. Correct. And it's hard to see maybe in the room here, hopefully you can see online, but the, the elements are highly dependent on the sizing. So if you change your duct sizing, your deductions are going to change accordingly. Same thing with airflow. On an elbow element, I only used a thousand CFM on this, a very small volume element, but if your velocity of your duct and your size of your duct grows or shrinks, your corresponding sound is going to also change. And again, a lot of people will use this tool for duct sizing. What if I didn't want to use 24 by 24, but I use 32 by 18 ductwork? What if I lined all the ductwork and added a one inch liner to it? How is that going to affect it? It can be very powerful for you know comparative analysis. 
Um, I'm going to switch gears a bit here just for sake of time. We got about 30 minutes remaining in our session this morning, and I want to cover a few other points. So let's actually switch gears from acoustic analysis and uh, jump into a quick product kind of overview, and I'll end with a few solution examples here. Okay. So now that we've kind of become an expert in acoustics, I feel like you guys are all experts now. We're there. Let's quickly touch on what noise control products consist of and how they can be practically used. There's many different types of categories of silencers, and I'm gonna kind of quickly go through explaining how these things actually work and why there's so many types. Silencers in general, the most common type is a rectangular silencer like this. They're always sized to fit the ductwork. This isn't a standard product you have to pick in a certain length or width or height. It can be 14.2 inches high and 92.1 inches long and whatever dimensions you want. We build them to order. Every order is different. They're not in set sizes. We often build large assemblies with silencers too. For things like generators and chillers, where each of these nested components kind of fits together to build a bigger assembly. Elbow silencers, as we just used in our acoustic analysis, are another type that are similar to rectangular in construction with acoustic media and perforated metal, but they're now turning the air 90 degrees. And they work very well where you don't have a lot of space. For example, this image here has an elbow silencer dropping through that roof deck before it junctions and transitions through all the messy ductwork in a hospital in this case. And a quite useful device to mitigate all of that sound source energy before it has the chance to reverberate and radiate into the building itself. Circular silencers, I showed some examples earlier, are great for round duct applications or fans to attenuate nearby that source again, where sound energy is absorbed into the center pods or perimeter kind of insulation there. This is actually an example from the Price Research Center we looked at earlier. This is a, a mixed flow fan with an inlet and outlet silencer for feeding actually some of those ultra sweet display units we have in the lab so that the source of the air isn't actually disturbing our demonstration areas. Works very well for that intention. Silencers are available in a wide variety of materials and they're not only available in galvanized steel or you know, uh, galvanil material, we really select the material of the noise control product to suit the application. If you're working in an indoor pool application, you're probably worried about corrosion and maybe weight, where we would use things like aluminum or stainless steel. If it's painted, if it's going to be out in the environments, you might be worried about different considerations on material. Another thing that we offer is increasing the outer casing gauge to be able to limit the amount of sound transmission into the area that it's installed. And what I mean by that is kind of this graphical animation here, where if you have a fan system generating noise and air, usually that sound is contained within the ductwork. But when that duct is thin in gauge and thickness, the actual sound is going to break out of that casing and potentially enter into an occupied space, causing sound issues that might not be considered when you're designing a system. Putting a silencer in often helps with attenuating the noise from the fan, but depending on the location and the size and the configuration of the silencer, that may not help the breakout noise concerns that could be present. For example, the silencer here is going to limit that induct supply noise, but that radiated noise could still be a concern causing issues. By putting a silencer in a more appropriate location, this would actually help to limit the induct noise, but also that breakout noise that would otherwise be causing disturbances in an occupied space below. And that's where the casing gauge, the thickness of that duct and silencer really come into play, where you're worried about the transmission loss of sound in an area where otherwise might be of concern. Silencers typically use an acoustic media in behind the perforated metal that the baffles are contained with. 
The most common acoustic media is actually a glass fiber acoustic media that is a long strand kind of binded material that comes in thick kind of high density rolls that insulation is contained within perforated metal baffles and as sound and air pass through these units that sound energy is absorbed in those baffles. We also use a natural cotton fiber and mineral wool or necessary or specified, but quite a bit less common than traditional glass fiber acoustic media. There's many different types of media protection available, and these are essentially liners and protected uh, films that can go over top of that acoustic media. Fiberglass cloth liner is one option. It's a tightly woven fabric. It kind of feels like a satin silk material, and it's encapsulating that, that insulation to prevent any sort of erosion or shedding when silencers are installed in a high velocity or high demand area. Another very common option is a polymer film lining. This is a thin polymer or plastic film that actually encapsulates the acoustic media to prevent shedding or any sort of exposed glass fiber in the airstream. We use a uh, acoustic standoff on all of these units, which is a thin spacer in between the perforated metal and the acoustic media to optimize the performance. And it works very well for that purpose. Just super quick, Chris. So yeah. you, so price offers polymer liner and then polymer liner bagged. Yeah. Can you articulate the merits of one versus the other? So. When we do bagged, we go to a very extensive bagging process that fully encapsulates and seals the media. The liner is a similar type of process. It's just not as fully sealed on the backside. It's more a liner around the media, not fully sealing it. So the liner is more applied to the perf in that yeah. case. So if you can picture a silencer and the inner wall is perf, you'd have polymer liner up to it held in place by the standoff and then media sh shoved behind it. Correct. So we do still wrap the media on the line types. Okay. Um, it's just not as extensive of a sealing process. It's a little bit more labor intensive to seal those bags essentially where it gets contained. Okay. Um, it's, it's very similar though. Like when we look at the process, the, the test data isn't any different. I'm just wondering like, Oh, when would I recommend Bagging bags versus versus. Yeah, usually bagging is done when you really need, you know, a contaminant free 100% sealed polymer encapsulated bag. So for a, a hospital, like, do you usually recommend one or the other? I usually recommend the bagging. It's a small cost adder to go to bagging from mining, but it's the better option when you're considering polymer film. Okay. Um, and it's just fully encapsulating and sealing that media. Maybe you guys could put a video together for that. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. We talked about eliminating the liner and just moving to bagged exclusively. And that may be something we do. Or that. Because honestly, like we typically bag all of them anyways, almost like it's when you're doing it, it's almost easier to fully encapsulate it, bag it. So right. it is an option though that you can select from. Just hey, everybody here and out there, remember when you use the polymer media. It changes the acoustic performance, which sometimes is like, hey, I picked a silencer, which is all fiberglass. And then I go, by the way, I want it um, isolated from the airstream. That changes your, your performance. So yeah. you can't have it both ways, unfortunately. It's a great point. The polymer film does degrade the performance. So it is unfortunate, but a necessary evil. The acoustic media, unbagged, unlined, just raw sort of in its absorptive form is the highest performing kind of best option yep. when applicable. A uh, question came up earlier. Was there a question? Go does ahead. it change any performance with the bagged and the unbagged one? Because the no. performance doesn't change, right? The bagged and the line perform equivalently, but okay. unbagged or lined compared to absorptive is a significant difference. There was a question earlier about um, critical spaces and cleanability. I can't recall what the application was, a restaurant or food, grade. food service. Food production. Food production. This is where packless silencers come into play. There's no acoustic media bagged or lined or unlined. It's all metal construction. 
Often these are stainless steel or aluminum just because of the application and the connecting ductwork. Things like fume hood exhausts, electronics manufacturing, kitchen exhausts, where you're really worried about contaminants or corrosion in the airstream, packless silencers are a great option. From a performance standpoint, the least performing of the options, because again, there's no acoustic media, they use the science of these tuned chambers and spacing of the baffles when sound waves enter in here, some of that sound energy enters into these chambers and is dissipated through that purpose. They work similar to what we call like a Hemholtz resonator, if you're familiar with that. Almost when you take a beer bottle and blow over the top of it, some of that sound will enter into the bottle and some will cross over it. And you can weld it if you need to. A lot of these are continuously welded. Um, we add UL listed access doors into the chambers and drain ports so you can wash down your duct. We've done a few uh, kitchen exhaust applications where there's many codes and specifications around grease duct and accessibility and clean out and UL listings and things, but they can be highly customized to your needs. Another section I just wanted to quickly touch on is air transfer silencers. And these are great solutions for unducted, low-velocity air transfer between spaces, often in a roof plenum and an occupied space below. There's three main categories, a return air canopy, a return air silencer, and a crosstalk silencer. And they all work similarly in intent, but provide great attenuation between an open plenum return and the occupied spaces below, or spaces adjacent to each other that have transfer of air between them. Things like these wall returns where you may need a silencer in behind that to help muffle or attenuate the noise that would otherwise be transferred. Crosstalks are one type, an L, a U, and a Z shape are the most common. And again, they get installed in between partitions where you have air returning and noise that would otherwise return with it that can cause a lot of disturbances and problems. Return air silencers, or RAS, is another type of silencer that works extremely well where you have either a ceiling or a wall return grill and sound problems transmitting across those spaces. Something like this here, where you'd have maybe a, a ceiling return and sound from a fan-powered box that would otherwise be transmitted down into that space. A simple four-inch thick, low-weight, low-cost silencer that can be installed as, like I mentioned, a return grill accessory. And then finally, one of my personal favorite air transfer devices that works very well is a return air canopy. And as depicted, it's essentially a canopy that goes into the T-bar grid in a ceiling over top of an otherwise fully open return grill. These work extremely well due to their construction and design, and they have a sheet metal casing with a fiberglass acoustic media on the bottom side. One of the added benefits that we hear a lot from owners and architects and contractors is that when installing one of these over an open return, you get the added benefit of a light shield and the acoustic media is black and all you see once it's installed is the blacked out underside of the canopy instead of maybe into your plenum space. And by blocking not only the line of sight, but that acoustic media, you can attenuate a lot of noise that would otherwise be transferred across spaces. There's a great question in the chat from yeah. Dan. When would you recommend the RAS instead of the RAC? For me personally, we see the RAS used in walls a lot more than ceilings. Because of its thin profile, you can actually put it into something like a stud wall and mud it into the wall, grill over top, and it's sort of concealed as a return grill silencer. It can be used in a ceiling, but we see the canopy used a lot more in ceiling applications than walls. The RAS is a great kind of wall return silencer. We've done custom models too, where they're very thin to go even in something like a door or in a, a tight wall space, but the return air canopy typically in ceilings, return air silencer typically in walls is where we see them. A quick question is, where would you see a return air canopy being used? An open plan office, a private office, or a gymnasium? Anyone? Private office. Private office, yeah. 
you, you need a ceiling for a canopy to be used. It doesn't really work well in that you know modern looking exposed um, application of uh, an office space. You need a ceiling with a return grill to be able to use that. One of the biggest reasons these up going. Does a return air canopy work in a cloud ceiling? Depends what's above the cloud, I guess. <laughs> if you had a fan powered terminal unit right above a cloud, potentially. Because you still have noise coming around the yeah. sides. It's, I don't know what architect came up with cloud ceilings, but it just seems like the worst idea in the world. They're limiting from acoustics because like you said, Sound is kind of like water. It's going to take the path of least resistance. And if there's a large opening, um, it's going to transmit kind of across that. Let me give you a ticket for answering that one. All right. Why do these work so well? Well, this image here actually explains it in the middle. When you have a T bar ceiling system with ceiling tiles, one of the limitations of that ceiling is the return grill. You've got a large, wide open, free area, 24 inch by 24 inch return grill. By having that, you've effectively limited your ceiling attenuation class or CAC value of that assembly. Any sound above or below is going to easily find its way through that open return. By adding an RAS or a RAC or some type of air transfer silencer, to those otherwise completely open return helps substantially. And this table kind of shows the science behind why these work so well. At the bottom is your noise reduction performance of something like a fiberglass or a mineral fiber ceiling tile. And the idea and the intent is that an RAS or an RAC, we previously called this the PLRD, that's what that's referencing here, PLRD is essentially equal to RAS. It's a bit less of a tongue twister, so we updated the name on it. And the idea is that these products perform equal or greater to a comparable ceiling tile. So when you have a ceiling like these up here with a large open return, and you're worried about sound transfer in or out of the plenum, I highly recommend considering one of these air transfer type silencers. So in other words, you're not worried as much about the sound source. This is more like the, you need to outrun the bear. You don't need to outrun the bear. You need to outrun your friend. Exactly. Right. The path of least resistance or. Okay. We're going to jump from our product overview into some kind of really cool applications of all this stuff. You guys know a lot about the fundamentals of acoustics. Now, you know, about the acoustic predictive analysis, the lab, the standards we test to, as well as a lot of our products. Let's actually look at. What does this actually mean? How do we actually solve real problems? Acoustic panels, we haven't talked a lot about today, but they're a great solution to large problems and air moving solutions that might need, need uh, design. This is a, an application for acoustic panels where we build plenums out of those panels. And you can kind of see here, these are average size, you know, people in a large outdoor air intake plenum. And these are essentially four inch thick tongue and groove double wall metal panels to build up this large system and array to ventilate and transmit air throughout a facility. In this example, these aren't actually perforated. This is solid metal because they're more worried about containing and pressurizing that plenum rather than acoustically absorbing the sound energy. We also do a lot of work in the outdoor environment with acoustic panels, building things like barrier walls and sound absorption panels on surfaces to block and absorb that noise. Like we learned about STC, NRC, sound blocking, sound transmission, sound absorption. That's what these panels do a great job of. This was a neat project in Atlanta at a bakery supply company that in behind this wall, there's large dehumidification units that were running 24 seven, disturbing the neighbors quite extensively. And we worked together, we took sound measurements and designed a structurally reinforced barrier wall on two sides of the facility, and then acoustically mounted walls on the inside to prevent that sound from reflecting and refracting off the building itself. Worked extremely well to drop down the sound within the property 
below the bylaw requirements. Acoustic louvers we learned about, and this is a practical kind of solution that we did in a neat project on a rooftop of a hotel in Vancouver, Canada. And the idea with this is that the owner of the hotel installed some really nice new shiny mechanical equipment, but didn't want it to be observable from the actual property. They wanted it to be concealed. They were also worried about the noise radiating into the environment and disturbing guests at the hotel. So we designed an acoustic louvered enclosure to fully encase that equipment while still allowing airflow and heat transfer in and out of the space. Kind of a neat look at how to conceal and attenuate mechanical equipment. We use acoustic panels a lot for custom air handler units. So this was a, a retrofit to an aging air handler unit. And this entire wall section here is actually price acoustic panels with that interlocking tongue and groove. And these panels make up a great solution for bringing in a new casing through something like a freight elevator where you can't actually replace maybe otherwise equipment cabinets like that. Access doors um, are quite common as well, where you can gain access in or out of these type of air handlers. Do you make or buy your doors? We actually purchase them. We don't manufacture our doors. That's a tricky, that's a tricky animal. Yeah, we did for a time, but there's experts in access doors that we lean on and we have partnerships with that make a great extruded aluminum frame and handles. And we currently purchase them. We don't manufacture them. And it works great for that purpose. And they're all pressure rated and tested, and it's a, a great option that we use. This is a look at the inside of that air handler casing, perforated metal for sound, as well as a lot of provisions for things like structural steel, but piping, plumbing, electrical filters, um, kind of a full package solution around that. We do a lot of work on CAD design as well. And if you guys are working on projects or you have sound issues, We've got a great team at Price that do CAD renderings prior to construction. While we're doing the acoustic analysis, we'll also do up things like this, like scale models and sketches of what might be possible to attenuate the noise from something like a chiller or an air handler or a generator. Um, and we take kind of our CAD models and build off of them into actual engineering designs or real world kind of installed examples. This is a generator application. There was a large intake to a generator housing, and they had a lot of problems with sound on the inlet side of this generator. And we worked with them to design an integrated silencer and acoustic panel kind of enclosure around that generator intake, where sound was all attenuated within the plenum and the silencers, but air was still allowed to intake into the facility as needed. Chillers are very common sound issues and can be complicated because they require heat rejection and airflow, and there's multiple sound sources, the condensing fans, the compressors, um, there's many different types of noise emitted from chillers. And we often design solutions working together with chiller manufacturers, silencers and acoustic panels kind of in combination to build a large kind of structural uh, solution around a chiller noise issue. This was kind of a neat project in Virginia, and there's a large acoustic enclosure combined with silencers on the inlet and discharge side of this chiller to allow air and heat to be uh, rejected and attenuated, but also the noise to be mitigated. This was kind of a neat one where there was condos literally several feet away from the chiller, and uh, as soon as they installed the chiller and turned it on, Everybody on that north side of the building was complaining and they needed a solution quite quickly and we worked together to come up with this kind of neat integrated assembly. The condensing fans on chillers are a big consideration because of minimal pressure drop allowances and air needs to be obviously exhausted and flowed through uh, appropriately, but we, we worked together a lot with chiller manufacturers to come up with noise control solutions. And there's the project team on that one. Another thing that we do a lot of is acoustic panels in their sort of raw form look a little bit industrial. They're unpainted, often galvanized steel. When you apply a powder coat paint finish to these products, and that's something we do a lot of at price, 
it changes the overall look and feel and maybe architectural usage of these products from a less industrial, more modern kind of finished product. And we use these acoustic panels to design and build barrier walls and things of that nature. This is a neat project we were involved with last year called Jefferson Middle School in uh, Minnesota. And this school basically had new mechanical equipment installed on the rooftop, causing a lot of disturbances into the neighborhood because it was located in a very densely populated sort of uh, residential neighborhood. And for whatever reason, when they purchased and installed and lifted all the equipment on the roof, nobody thought of the sound impact. They actually measured sound at 98.5 dBC when the equipment was running, which is extremely loud. And even at the property line across from the school, they were at 80 dBC, which is, you know, 80 decibels is extremely loud when guidelines require maybe like 65 dBC or 55 dBA. Very, very loud sound measurements were done. We worked really closely with the project team on this one to come up with a solution to meet the bylaw of that district, which was basically 55 to 60 dBA. And what we did was we basically came up with a proposal to attenuate the noise from multiple systems and air handler units on the rooftop of this facility. The end result was quite positive. And uh, there was a chiller as well as a large air handler radiating and reverberating into the neighborhood. We initially came up with a proposal that was a fully encompassed barrier wall around the equipment, as well as a silencer package on the chiller to knock down that level from 80 to basically 60 dBC. Uh, we do a lot of work as well on structural design. These barrier walls become quite large. And uh, when installed on a rooftop, you need to be concerned with things like wind load, snow load, um, seismic concerns in certain regions of the country. I had these pictures earlier, but we do things like PE stamping drawings, doing FEA analysis, structural analysis, to make sure that our solution will hold strong in whatever region it's being installed. Um, the end result was quite awesome. Um, we've actually got some dr drone footage of this one, which drones are pretty cool. I've always wanted one, but never actually used one. But uh, what you see here, this off-white color barrier, these are all price acoustic panels installed on a structural steel frame and integrated kind of into the design. That's actually Mauricio and my team we met earlier in the video, taking some sound measurements post-installation. Um, there's a weird kind of optical illusion because the sun was setting when we we're doing some of these measurements, but uh, a really neat look at how these products can be integrated into a noisy HVAC system on the outdoor environment. Was that a planned retrofit or was it, oh boy, this thing is too loud? It was, oh boy, there's going to be a lawsuit against the school because the steel was there? Some of the steel was existing, the platform, bottom, the platform was there, but, but a lot of the bracing and the, peripheral steel we needed to spec and provide as part of the package. So you did everything up from the platform? Correct. There was some steel present and there was actually like a louvered wall on a portion that basically did nothing for acoustics. But all of the, the panel supports at the bottom and the top were designed and provided by us. These homes here, and there were several of them, kind of banded together and said, you know, you need to come up with something. The school tried to shut the system off at 5 p.m. when people left and turn it on when they got back. But then the school went into overheating mode and it was kind of a nightmare. And this project turned around very quickly because when people are threatening lawsuits, they tend to move quick, but uh, a really, really positive solution. And we do a lot of work like this, whether it's after the fact or at the preliminary kind of design stage. The end result um, brought us down slide here. These pictures are massive. The end result caught us down to 61 dBC, which a 20 dB reduction is substantial. dBC is a different type of rating that measures peak frequencies, not so much overall A-weighted, uh, but it was roughly 55 dBA, which was exactly where we needed to be. One-fourth the sound, right? Yeah, that sounds right. 
Do you remember that slide I had? Mm -hmm. 10 times. 10 was double. 20, 20 30, was quadruple. Four times, eight times. Yeah, you got it. Thanks for paying attention. There is a quiz I think we have maybe for people That's that are yeah. the PDH we'll watch it later. online, but uh, you guys would all ace the quiz, I feel. So again, really successful job, kind of a neat application for acoustic panels. There's going to be a case study. I think you mentioned it maybe came out yesterday. So you're one of the first groups to see this before that. One of the big takeaways from this was engage with us as early as possible. I've got a really strong team on engineering design and acoustics. We often do site surveys. We'll go out to site, take sound measurements. We can help solve problems. And that's kind of what we do as a, a business unit. Um, we also used our acoustic predictive software to design this wall and know, you know, the height, the parameters, the thickness, the materials to be able to have confidence we'd meet our design goal. And then finally, um, providing the full package solution, structural steel, panel, silencers, access doors. We're almost at time, but I wanted to share maybe one last one or two here with you guys. Um, acoustic panels, again, extremely customizable. And I really encourage you, if you're ever dealing with a sound issue, consider acoustic panels as a solution, whether it's an air handler unit barrier wall, or in this case, a generator housing. We actually designed and have built full size acoustical housings for generators, where this is actually the same acoustic panels as you saw in the Jefferson barrier wall, but now designed and installed around a generator in this case. One of the unique natures of this design was that the housing needed to be fully assembled and then lifted over top of the actual generator itself on a fuel tank. And as part of that, there's a lot of considerations that go into the rigidity and the structural soundness. You can see it's lifted off the ground in this example where they actually lift it over top of that gen set. And uh, we take on a lot of that design work to make sure it's braced and secured and supported appropriately so that it can withstand those loads. These are also transported quite far distances on flatbed trailers and trucks. And that transportation load is a real consideration for things like buckling and um, loading of certain wall elements and seismic bracing supports. Do you transport that entire thing as one piece or do you break it down at all? So this was actually, we manufactured it in elements like these pieces. And then we had a partner assemble it in one piece and then transport it and then assemble it onto the gen set. So it kind of went in multiple parts. We build them in kind of piece parts. They get assembled into one unit as shown here and then dropped over top after the fact. So kind of a really neat custom example of how acoustic panels can be used in a, a high performance situation. We also do a lot of work on just custom fan housings and things like this where Fans are often loud, whether they're um, uh, you know, EC fans or mixed flow fans or uh, axial fans. We build custom enclosures around all sorts of types of fans. And it comes in handy for not just the discharge or inlet noise, but the radiated noise from these fans. Um, silencers on fans are quite common as well applying discharge or inlet or outlet silencers are very common. And we work with a lot of the fan manufacturers in the industry, the Cook, the Green Hex, the Twin Cities, the whoever makes fans these days. Um, a lot of our silencers will get paired with different types of fans. Chillers, I kind of mentioned earlier, silencers and acoustic panels. And then finally, just custom solutions. This is a, a VRF application that has condensing units and fans and things outside in a parking lot next to residences. And we came up with this kind of funky silencer acoustic enclosure around VRF units. Um, custom silencers as well. We really don't like saying no to things as a business unit. And often we'll get into very large custom silencers as well. This is a, like a stack silencer, almost the size of like a semi truck, where you can see just how large these units can become. Generators are one last application as well. Generators make a lot of noise. And because of that, combining panels and silencers into a solution is something we do a lot of. And it's quite common for uh, one of the noisiest sound sources that we see. 
And this is kind of the last slide I had, a really interesting application I like to share with people. So where I'm from up in Winnipeg, the river freezes solid in the winter months and it's about four feet thick of ice. And as part of that, for whatever reason, we like to go outside and ice skate in the freezing cold. And we got invited to design and build what we call a warming hut. So this was a part of an architectural competition that we were invited to on a local kind of firm. And this is an acoustic panel warming hut. So it's a bit of an oxymoron because it's a cold metal frozen box. There's no actual heat in there, but the attendees kind of come up with really neat artsy and architectural options for warming huts. So kind of a neat application for how these acoustic panels can be built. And if you're ever in Winnipeg in the winter, I encourage you to go ice skating on the river. And when you go in here, it's a really neat anechoic feeling where it's a frozen metal box with perforated metal. You can kind of hear yourself think on the rivers. So very cool application. And then finally, in closing, this is actually a real picture someone sent me that they were trying to control the noise from some HVAC unit on a rooftop. I'm pretty sure these are floor mats and like duct tape. There's more elegant ways to control noise as I've kind of shown you over the last three hours or so. I really encourage you to lean on us, work with the airflow team. It's a great group of people and uh, we can help solve problems. So great. I hope this was useful. We went a few minutes over, I think, but we're pretty good on time. Great job as usual, Chris. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate and, uh, it. To all of you who are, well, to Anna and to everybody who's attending remotely, we'll get you your PDHs probably next week and a recording will be up. And so your colleagues who haven't had a chance to, didn't have a chance to attend today can watch and then take a quiz and get their PDH credits too. So thanks everybody. And we'll see you next month for a dehumidification class. All right. Awesome. Appreciate, appreciate it. Chris. Thanks everyone. All right.